<clears throat> yes, I am ready. Okay. Oh. I would like to call the South Bend Common Council meeting Monday, January 24th, 2022 to order. Clerk Jones, I believe you would like to make some comments regarding the link and meeting yeah. and the other expectations. Yes. Good evening, members of the public. For audio quality, we will be muting everyone not speaking by default to maintain good audio quality for council and yourselves. If you would like to speak during the meeting on a specific agenda item, please submit your request in the chat and directions to do so are in the chat. We ask that you provide your full name and address as those are required for in-person meetings. If you would like to be called on during the meeting to provide public input, please insert the following into the chat and you will be called on during the relevant time for public input. You insert your name, your address, and what you would like to speak on, which agenda item, whether you like to speak for or against. Please place that in the chat. And for citizens that wish to speak during the privilege of the floor, please insert the following into the chat and the council president will call on you during the relevant time for public input. Insert your name and your address and you will be given three minutes to speak during privilege of the floor. Floor. Please be sure to unmute yourself prior to giving your remarks. Thank you so much. Just a reminder that disrespectful, rude, or disruptive speech or actions will not be tolerated. Such speech and or actions, as well as verbal attacks on any person, may result in an individual without notice forfeiting the remainder of his or her allotted time. With that, we will welcome uh, Iman Muhammad with the Islamic Society of Michiana for our invocation. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening and greetings of peace. Please join me in a brief prayer this evening. Ya Rabbal Alameen, O Lord of all humankind, we thank you for all the blessings, blessings of sound body, mind and spirit. Ya Rahman, Ya Rahim, Lord of mercy and compassion, we implore your mercy to keep us safe and healthy from all kinds of diseases and infections. Our Lord, most generous, most kind, forgive us our sins and shortcomings. Open our hearts and minds to overcome our challenges and divisions. And see your wisdom and beauty in our diversity. O oh Lord, you are always almighty. Grant our leaders wisdom and guide them to use their power to serve the good of all and to fashion a more just, peaceful and caring world. Our Lord, you are all knowing. You are the absolute owner of all the resources in the universe. We invoke your mercy to alleviate po poverty, to end cycle of violence and bring unity and peace to our city of South Bend and to our nation. Our Lord of compassion and mercy, save our people from all kinds of suffering and inspire us to assist the poor and the marginalized and make us channels to bring hope and happiness to the residents of our city, our county, our country, and to the desperate refugees and victims of war and violence everywhere. Our Lord, accept our prayers, grant our requests, and purify our hearts from ego, greed, and lower desires. Bless us all. Bless the United States of America and the city of South Bend with peace, prosperity, and the pursuit of happiness. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you so much. At this time, Clerk Jones, could you please call the roll? Clerk Jones, I'm could sorry, you call the I'm roll? Sorry. I was muted. I'm sorry. Council Member Davis. Henry's here. Council Member Lee. Present. Council Member Warner. Here. Council Member Wax. Present. Council Member White. Present. Council Member Tomas Morgan. Present. 
Council Member Hammond. Present. Vice President Niskoski. Present. President McBride. Present. Nine present. Thank you. Just a reminder to all council members, being that we are virtual during our votes, any votes that we have, um, you have to have your audio and visual, visual both on according to Robert's rules. Thank you so much. Um, we have no city rep uh, subcommittee reports and we will move straight into our special business a resolution recognizing the city's first baby box at fire station 11. Um, we would I would turn it over to uh, the sponsor Eli Wax. President. Um, I was honored along with uh, council member C uh, about a week and a half ago to and the uh, dedication of South Bend's first baby box. Um, for anybody who isn't aware, that's a um, box that's uh, specially designed where someone who um, feels that they're not in a position to take care of their new child uh, can bring the baby and uh, totally anonymous brings the child to uh, this baby box and drop it off where it'll be immediately cared for. Um, by the fire department in this case, um, and this way will provide the safety of the baby and allow the mother um, to do what she needs to do with anonymity and without any repercussions. Um, South Bend has not uh, had baby box in the past. Uh, this is actually our first, and so it was very exciting uh, to be able to be there for that. And I wanted to. Um, have an opportunity to thank the fire department who um, is taking responsibility for this baby box and for all those who contributed to help make this happen. Uh, I don't know if I have anybody here to, uh, to present on it if, if they would like any of the um, participants, but if they are here, um, feel free to um, make yourself known, either raise your hand and we'll find you. Um, otherwise, I would uh, offer it to Council Member Lee, who co sponsored this with me, along with other members of the council, um, if they would like to uh, say anything before we go on to the resolution itself. Thank you, um, Eli. We appreciate it. Um, along with what um, Councilman Wax said it was a great event to be at for the first ever Safe Haven Baby Box being in the first district at uh, Fire Station 11. A um, few years ago we had you know individuals who who weren't able to care for their babies and they had no results no other result but to uh, put it in a dumpster or or um, you know do harm to it. This gives uh, a mother an opportunity to give up that child so that that child can have an opportunity to live. I think they say the baby only will be in the box for less than a minute. Once the baby is put in the box, the siren alarm goes off and there's someone always at the fire station. So it's really a great opportunity for a person to uh, choose another result other than doing something tragic. So I was pleased and thank you to uh, Fire Chief Buchanan and uh, the Knights of Columbus and uh, Kirk Concrete and so many other people who were instrumental in getting this uh, put in at the fire station. And uh, I am excited that another option is available and um, and and hopefully a life is safe. So thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else uh, from the council who um, would like to say anything before moving to the? I would just like to say thank you, um, Councilman Wax, for allowing me the opportunity. I was blessed to be a part of uh, going to the dedication as well, and to see how the fire department has it set up uh, to drop the baby off, and the baby will still be warm and cared for, and all of the precautions and how they can get to the baby and provide immediate medical care um, within a minute is just 
uh, remarkable. So it just shows another level of care and um, uh, expertise that we have from our first responders. And so I'm just uh, happy to be a part of the resolution. Thank you, and again, my apologies for not mentioning the presence of this. I did enjoy seeing you there as well. Um, I'm having technical difficulties, so I can't really, I can hear everybody, but I can't see anybody or see anything. So um, if there's anybody else, please doubt on me. Otherwise, I'll continue with uh, reading the resolution. Nobody at this time. Okay, would, would you like me to read it? You're a little muffled, um, Eli. My apologies. I'm having, I truly apologize. I must be having some technical. I think that may be a little bit better if um, you can try it. And if not, uh, one of us could try to help you out. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I start to read and see where we go from here. Um, so this is a special resolution of the South Bend Common Council recognizing the city's first baby box of fire station 11 on Bend Avenue. Whereas in the Indiana State Haven law permits an emergency medical services provider to take custody of a child who is not more than 30 days old, the child is voluntarily left in a newborn safety device located at a fire department that meets very stringent minimum requirements for the safety of the newborn. And whereas Indiana law, under certain circumstances, requires information about Indiana safe haven law and newborn safety devices to be present to pregnant women, and whereas Indiana safe haven law also provides immunity to parents who anonymously surrender newborn to safe haven baby boxes, and whereas the safe haven baby box is designated to protect precious newborns by reducing infant abandonment by parents who feel they cannot care for their newborns and have no alternative. And whereas on January 13th, 2022, the 93rd Safe Haven Baby Box in the Nation, the 76th in Indiana, and the first in St. Joseph County was dedicated by city officials in the Knights of Columbus. And whereas major contributors uh, to the baby box include the Knights of Columbus, First Response Disaster, Restoration Specialist, First Concrete, the Cement Masons Union, First Layer Union, Local 362 Firefighters Union. And Monica and Joe Kelsey, the founders of the Safe Haven Baby Box. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, as follows. We thank the firefighters, especially those at, uh, located at Station 11 at 3505 North Bendix Drive in South Bend, Indiana, 46628, for their dedication to the health and safety of the most vulnerable population. In Section 2, we also thank those. Thank all who contributed to making the Safe Haven Baby Box a reality in South Bend. For this 24th day, January 2022. Thank you so much. Thank At I this agree. time, I'll turn it to um, Council to see if there's any uh, input or question. I see uh, Councilwoman Hammond with her hand up. Yes, I would just like to speak in support of this resolution. My husband and I have a number of people that were instrumental in um, helping to move this forward. I think it's an amazing um, development for the city, something very much needed. And I appreciate the hard work of the firefighters. So thank you. Thank you. Also, I believe I see Councilman Davis. What precipitated uh, this action, meaning the baby box itself being the, uh, installed at that fire station? Uh, do we have people who are dropping babies off somewhere? I mean, I, I'm just trying to understand where did this, you know, come from? I'm not saying it's a bad idea. I just want to know what's actually happening. I don't know if Eli, if you want to speak a little bit more about it or um, if we have uh, the fire chief on the line or also the creator of the baby box. But yes, there is a need. I know throughout the country, I believe it's 93. South Bend, USA. not USA, it's South Bend now. I was given some context. That's not that. context. I have a message about South Bend. It, it may help Point someone else. It may help someone else, Mr. Davis. 
Well, but, uh, help okay. me. I'm the one to ask the question now. Help me out. Uh, Mr. Wax, would you like to um, provide a little bit more context, please? Uh, I, sure. I probably am not the most knowledgeable person on the subject. But um, this, unfortunately, is an issue um, that we deal with nationally. I'm not aware of there being any incidents locally, but I'm thankful that we have an opportunity to potentially save a child um, before. I would be, it would be devastating to have an incident in which the child was abandoned and um, did not have a good outcome um, without having this opportunity. So. I hope that this box will not be necessary, but I'm so glad that it's here, could it be? It's really hard to hear you, Eli. It's extremely hard to hear you. I'm not, I don't know what's going on, um, but it's just really hard. I think I caught the gist of what you were saying. Um, so I, I was wondering, has some babies been dropped off in other places? I think Kenneth alluded to that earlier. Um, I've never heard of that. Which a, which is a really really um, uh, traumatic thing, you know, on both ends for the baby and for the mother to even feel like that she needs to drop a baby off. So, sure, that is definitely something that you know I do not want to see. I'm just interested in finding out or knowing what actually precipitated this move outside of the national conversation. Um, and there also is more of a conversation when you're dealing with. Um, it was such a traumatic experience where when you get moved closer into the city, more so in, in, in what we would call the inner city, we have abortion clinics there. We don't have drop off boxes. And so that is also telling of what resources are available for the people who seemingly may not have any money or any resources versus those who seemingly do have it. So just I'm just putting it out there because I do pay attention, great action. I do support it. But when we do something for one, we have to do it for the other. We have abortion clinics up and down Lincoln Way West. We've had them in the, as we call the hood for years, but we don't get a baby box in the hood. We get abortion clinics outside of the hood. We get baby boxes, not a very good look, but thank you again for bringing this forward. I can get you some statistics from the fire department and uh, about the number that you asked about how many numbers in South Bend, if any. Um, I think I see Councilwoman Niskoski's hand. Uh, thank you, President Ms. McBride. I just wanted to thank Eli and Councilman Lee for bringing this uh, to the council, um, giving any mother an opportunity uh, to as hard as it may be for her to give that baby up, who knows what's happening at that moment in her life, but be able to save even one life is, is monumental. Um, and I wish I would have been able to attend that. Um, I was not able to, to a previous commitment, um, but I fully support that. And if we can help save one baby, one life, I, I am all for it. So thank you so much to both council members for bringing this forward. And thank you to our police department and everybody in the community that supported this action. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councilwoman Rachel Tomas Morgan. Thank you, President McBride. I too just wanna add my thanks to the sponsors of this resolution. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend it uh, last week um, due to scheduling conflict but I'm grateful that there is this option that exists in our community. Thank you, Councilwoman White. Yes, I would like to thank the sponsors for bringing this resolution before us, along with the firefighters, um, as well as the chief of uh, the fire chief. Um, this is an issue that impacts at a level that we may not necessarily have experienced in South Bend, but does not mean that we will not. So again, thank you for bringing this before the council. And it's just another option that we can provide within our city. Thank you. Um, with that, I'll turn um, to see if there's anyone from the public wishing to speak. And uh, do you see anyone, uh, Clark Jones? No, I do not see anyone from the public expressing interest to speak on this. 
Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Councilman Wax, again, for bringing such an important uh, resolution to uh, our attention and to bring awareness uh, to the city of South Bend for uh, a woman who may be in need uh, to utilize the box. And again, a special thank you to the firefighters who are uh, ready and prepared. And if you have not seen it, we encourage you to go out to Fire Station 11 on the corner of Bendix and Cleveland Road to see how the baby box is um, set up and, and just the process that they grow through to make sure that if a person in distress even just give birth to a baby and drop it off, they are ready and equipped to um, get that baby emergency treatment right away. Thank you so much. Okay. At this time, I would like to make a motion um, to rise and uh, go into the committee of the whole. So moved. So moved. May we have a roll? Um, <clears throat> Council Member Davis. Aye. Council Member Lee? Aye. Council Member Warner? Aye. Council Member Wax? Aye. Council Member White? Aye. Council Member Thomas Morgan? Aye. Council Member Hammond? Aye. Vice President Niskoski? Aye. President McBride? Aye. Nine eyes. All right, the committee of, whole, of the whole is in session. This is the portion of the council's meeting where bills are given a second reading and public hearing. I wish to share with you that the bills that will be given a second reading and a public hearing have been given a first reading and, a, and set for a committee meeting and public hearing prior to this evening's meeting. In addition, you will hear from the chairperson of the committee where the bill was discussed and the results of their discussion. If the proposed or if the proposed ordinance is a zoning ordinance, a report from a staff member will be given. In all other situations, the formal presentation on the proposed ordinance will immediately follow the committee report. The, the formal presentation shall be untimed. Bill 140-21, Clerk Jones, will you please give Bill 140-21 a second reading? Yes. 14021, public hearing on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, amending the zoning ordinance for property located at 340 East Walter, Councilmanic District Number 5 in the City of South Bend, Indiana. Is there a committee report? Yes, Chair. This afternoon, Bill 140-21 came before the Zoning and Annexation Committee and comes to the committee of the whole with a favorable recommendation. Is the petitioner present? And I ask that you state your name and address and share with us key points regarding the bill that is before us. Yes, hi, <clears throat> Mike Huber, Abbott Marsh Consultants 315 West Jefferson Boulevard, South Bend, Indiana. Um, I'm representing Gates Automotive this evening. Um, our petition is to rezone a portion of a lot that's currently zoned uh, S1 residential to C commercial to support the development of a uh, automobile dealership on East Ireland Road. Um, the uh, we we were here about a year and a half ago uh, um, rezoning the property to the west of this adjacent. Um, we had to redesign uh, the site. Due to the fact that we're not going to use the existing building, we're going to use a new building and we're relocating the retention basin. The basin isn't uh, growing any, it's the same size, it's just in a more suitable location uh, on the adjacent property. We wish to maintain a 100 foot uh, property uh, buffer of the existing residential to the east and to the north um, in line with a 100 foot um, buffer that we maintain on our uh, property that we rezoned last year to the west. Um, and uh, we did reach out to the neighbors ahead of the meet, ahead of the plan commission meeting and did not receive any feedback uh, either in support of or against from the neighbors uh, prior to that meeting. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Council members, do you have any questions of the petitioner?
No questions. At this time, we will go to the public hearing portion. Clerk Jones, is there anyone from the public wishing to speak for or in favor of Bill 140-21? There is no one from the public that is uh, expressing interest to speak in favor or in opposition of Bill 140-21. Is there anyone present wishing to speak in opposition? Oh, well, you said no. Okay. <laughs> At this point, the public hearing of Bill 140-21 is now closed. Council members, are there any statements that you'd like to make regarding Bill 140-21? If not, I will now entertain a motion regarding Bill 140-21. Chair, I believe we have a hand up from Councilman Eli mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I didn't see his hand, but go ahead. That's all right. Thank you so much. Um, I just, I hope I'm a little bit clearer now. Um, you are. Let me know if I'm not. Okay, I uh, just wanted to say that I did meet with the petitioners uh, and did see the site. Um, I was impressed with their plan and I appreciate how, uh, as far as I could tell, it provides very minimal impact to the neighbors and to the um, forest buffer there behind it. Uh, so I just want to lend my support to them and thank the petitioners for their continued investment in South Bend. Is there anybody else? All right, I will now entertain a motion regarding Bill 140-21. I'll make I a motion that Bill 140-21 the... Go ahead, Councilman Go ahead. Warren. Go ahead, President. No, you go Karen. ahead. <laughs> I'm fine. I make a motion okay. to send the bill with a favorable recommendation to the full council. Is there I'll a second? second it. I'll second it. All <laughs> right. The motion. The motion has been seconded. Clerk Jones, would you read? The, would you please call the roll for Bill One Forty Dash Twenty One? Yes. Uh, Councilman Councilmember Lee. Aye. Councilmember Warner. Aye. Councilmember Wax. Aye. Councilmember White. Aye. Councilmember Tomas Morgan. Aye. Councilmember Hammond. Aye. Vice President Niskoski. Aye. Councilmember Davis. Aye. President McBride. President McBride. You're muted. Aye. Nine eyes. All right. Motion passes. Uh, bill 141-21. Clerk Jones, will you please give Bill 141-21 a second reading? <clears throat> Public 141-21. Public hearing on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, amending the zoning ordinance for property located at 1105, 1111. 1115, 1117, 1118, 1120, 1121 Campaw Street, and 1116, 1124, 1125, 1128, 1132, 1133, 1134, 1135, 1136, 1137, and 1140 Corby Boulevard, Councilmanic District Number 4 in the City of South Bend, Indiana. Is there a committee report? Yes, Chair. This bill came before the um, Zoning and Annexation Committee this afternoon, and it comes to the Committee of the Whole with a favorable recommendation. Is the petitioner present? And I ask that you state your name and address and share with us key points regarding the bill that's before us. Uh, yes, Paul Fair with Holiday Properties offices at 3454 Douglas Road in South Bend. Um, I'll certainly be much more brief than I was this afternoon and be available for questions, but uh, we are seeking to rezone this site from U1 single family to NC Neighborhood Center. Uh, the purpose of the rezoning is to facilitate a mixed use development uh, at the corner of Corby and State Route 23. 
Um, the, the project has two key elements, a commercial component that will be located uh, right at the heart corner, as well as a, a multifamily apartment building that would be located south of the old Corby alignment. Uh, the project is approximately four stories and would feature 103 apartment units. Um, we really think that this is a uh, uh, we think this is a wonderful development for the area. It continues the momentum uh, that we've seen thus far um, in development to the north at Eddy Street Commons and at this intersection. Uh, we really think that the development uh, uh, helps to make this area more urban and walkable uh, in the uh, in the area, um, and if it's possible, I, I see the the uh, the slides changing. If somebody can make me a presenter, I'd be happy to put more up on go through the details of the plans if people would like to see that. Okay, there we go. All right, just give me one second. Thank you very much. Okay, all right, as I was mentioning, uh, this is a mixed use project. You can see the building that we're planning here. Uh, and again, this would be a development for the, uh, uh, that really does continue the urban, uh, urban development of this area. Uh, we think that the, the project at this location helps to really uh, cement walkability for people going to campus in downtown. Uh, with proximity along State Route 23, uh, we think that this is an appropriate project just due to the traffic that you see up and down this corridor, uh, 23,000 cars a day. It really lends itself to more dense development. Um, the Being at, at two signalized intersections at Corby and Camp Ow, it allows for the easy uh, pedestrian movements across 23. Um, and without that, this would be a more difficult uh, endeavor for sure. Um, just to, again, give a little bit more uh, context on location, we're located along South Bend Avenue, north of Camp Ow and south of Corby, in between the new office building that's been developed at, uh, at Corby and 23 on the northeast corner and part of the old Pearly School uh, south of Camp Ow. Uh, this is a, a site plan uh, showing the, the context of the project. Uh, at the corner, as I mentioned, would be a commercial uh, outlot. Uh, this has not been pegged for anything specific at this point. It would likely be a restaurant use or maybe a small office. Uh, we have slated about 5,000 square feet uh, that's shown in that green box uh, that would, again, complement everything that's happened at this intersection. So it would match the quality that you see there, what's uh, been built at Robinson Center, Trader Joe's, and the office building at this intersection. Uh, the large parking area directly south is making use of a, uh, uh, a large easement. As I mentioned previously in our committee meeting, uh, this site is challenging. A good chunk of it is not buildable because of large highway transmission lines. Uh, as well as sanitary and water utilities that run under the old Corby alignment. Uh, and while that street has been vacated, the easement associated with utilities has not. So these two dashed lines are, are, are easement lines that are not buildable for vertical development. Uh, so we're utilizing it as parking, and we will make sure to screen that parking uh, from the road as well as we possibly can. Uh, the apartment building is then south of the easement. Uh, and there's, there's a couple of features here. The area that's colored is a, a first floor wrap. That's a commercial space to the north, this light blue area. Uh, our administrative and leasing space in the navy blue uh, that would have leasing offices, management office, uh, fitness room, package room, things of that nature. And then the gold are residential units. Uh, the, the only residential units that would be on the streetscape. Uh, we would make sure to design this, we've been working with staff to design this so that it uh, um, would really uh, uh, interplay well with the, uh, the roadway. Um, the two gray areas are interior parking garages. These are single level garages at grade levels. So they're not structures, uh, but we wanted to make sure to try and capture as much parking on site as possible. Uh, as you may imagine, parking is a concern for a lot of neighbors, something we heard regularly. 
Uh, so we are trying to park the site as much as we can um, in order to accommodate uh, residents as well as potential commercial space in the future. Uh, so the, the two gray areas here are interior parking, and then there is a smaller exterior parking lot uh, on the south side of the project. Uh, most residents will enter and exit those garages on the alleyway here um, uh, that comes off of Camp Out going north-south. Uh, this will feed both garage areas as well as this exterior lot, and we will be widening this alleyway to accommodate. It'll be 20 to 24 feet to easily accommodate two-way traffic. Um, and then we will be repaving um, or, or paving for first time the east-west alleyway. We're going to encourage all of our residents to only use the north-south alleyway, uh, not use east-west to disrupt existing neighbors here. Um, but we will be making those improvements as part of our project. Um, this is a rendering showing the, the project. Um, the, we certainly want to match the quality that's been established in the area. Again, we think that, that creating an, an urban community here um, that really will, will be attractive to the 2030-somethings that, uh, that South Bend is, has probably not kept its fair share of over the years. Uh, part of it is really providing housing options that are attractive uh, to a younger demographic. Um, so we, we want to make sure that this is, is really looking good. And um, also, again, you can see here the, the stepping of the building. It really plays well with the streetscape, so you don't have just a single large wall uh, making it feel a little bit like a valley. These are, again, statistics on the project. Um, and a few things to point out. Uh, with the project is four stories. Uh, we, we initially had a plan for five stories that, again, we heard concerns of neighbors on scope and scale. Uh, so we reduced that from five to four stories, uh, which took it from 61 feet down to 50. Uh, again, to add context, uh, the, the office building across the street from us is approximately 63 feet in elevation. Uh, and Curly School is approximately 35 feet. So we, we tucked right in between those two. Uh, 103 total units, as I mentioned, and, and again, this is something that we reduced from our initial plan. Uh, initially, we were looking at a project that was somewhere between 135 and 145 units, uh, but we heard, uh, again, concerns of the, the scale here, um, so we pulled it back by approximately a third down to 103 units. Uh, and this is the, the makeup of those units, uh, 16 studios, 56 one beds, 31 two bedroom units. Uh, again, 145 total parking spaces on site. Uh, this is about a 1.4 ratio per unit. Um, so we feel like we have a good uh, amount of parking for the site and the project. Um, they, again, commercial space of roughly 8,000 square feet. Um, and we hope to start construction on this project in the second half of 2022. Uh, we believe that it'll be approximately an 18 month construction period. Um, we, we wanted to, again, as we met with, with different neighborhood groups and neighbors, we wanted to try and provide some tools that really showed the project in context. You know, it's always hard for people to visualize a new construction project. Um, especially one that, that's uh, um, you know, at a, a kind of key intersection uh, like this. So we, we worked with our design team to get some drone aerials that we could actually put the building model into to again show context in the, the existing uh, neighborhood surrounding us. And so this is the project looking from Trader Joe's to the southeast. Um, it's Coquiller Park in the background. Uh, and this is exactly the opposite. This is from Coquiller Park or Pearly, looking at, to the northwest uh, with Trader Joe's in the background, and then of course Eddy Street Commons going up to the university. Um, one item to, to point out here is a deck uh, uh, in the back of the building, a concern that, that you know, at pretty much every development here is a concern about additional noise. Uh, we really don't think that that's a concern for this project. Um, our units are pretty small. They will not be amenable to large gatherings. Um, the exterior balconies are, are not going to be sizable. They'll be comfortable for a unit, but you can't have large groups out. And this balcony that's being shown 
is actually not going to be accessible by the entire building. It'll just be these bottom residents that will um, have larger than normal balconies, but not this whole thing. So um, a portion of this will probably be used just for utilities, condensing units maybe, uh, but it will not be used for, for public access for the building. We do have balconies along the 23 side that will be used for that purpose. So if there are uh, quote unquote parties in the building, they would be on that 23 facade on those balconies. Um, again, to try and to give people good context as to how we fit into the neighborhood, we asked our design team to do a shadow study uh, to see what impact natural uh, on natural light for the neighbors we would have. Uh, so to again give context to the left here is State Route 23. This is Camp Out down at the bottom, Arthur to the right, uh, Corby up on the north. Um, so you can see we, we did three different slides here uh, on the respective solstice and equinoxes of the different uh, seasons. Um, and you can see in summer it has very little impact on, on shadowing or natural light. Uh, spring and fall is minor um, and not bleeding over into anybody's home. And then in winter, um, it, there is some bleeding over, but this is at 2.30 in the afternoon, so there's not a lot of daylight left uh, in the day at that point, uh, of course, uh, in the end of December. Um, I, I, I ran through that pretty quickly. I'm more than happy to answer any questions, but the, the conclusion is we, we really think that this is an, a, a great opportunity for continuation of, of development in the area uh, to, again, just provide a, a urban landscape for people who want to live downtown uh, or walk, I'm sorry, want to be work downtown or on campus um, and, and have a, a place where they can walk or bike um, and keep a, a relatively small footprint. Thank you. All right. Are there any um, any questions from the council members? I see a hand, and I don't know who. Yes, Henry. I'm going to ask you um, when we come back through. I want to make uh, some comments. I don't have a question for the petitioner. Okay. Any other council members have questions for the petitioner? If not at this time, oh, no, nope, don't see any hands. At this time, we will go to the public hearing portion. Is there, uh, Clerk Jones, is there anyone from the public wishing to speak in favor or against or, or opposition for Bill 141-21? Okay, I'm looking. <clears throat> no, there is no one uh, from the public wishing to speak in favor of this bill. Okay. If there is no one wishing to speak in favor or opposition, the public hearing on Bill 141-21 is now closed. Council members can make statements if they wish regarding Bill 141-21. Um, as, as this is a great project, um, obviously the free market has allowed um, uh, this this petitioner to come in and 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 expand the tax base over in that area, which is awesome. Um, really think that it is awesome. I think it's a great idea. Uh, has my full support. What what what, what I want to point to, and, and I hope that my council colleagues and the administration can actually lend their ear to, is the fact that over the last several months I've been having these town hall meetings. And uh, these town hall meetings have been aimed at the idea of affordable housing in areas where affordable housing should be and how we could develop affordable housing. Now, as this is, could be affordable for some people or, or not, you know, it, it remains to be seen, but this is what the petitioner is desiring. What I am going to point to is the fact that because of these developments and the amount of money that are being, that's being spent and invested in the area, it does impact I think it's a three mile radius, maybe even four mile radius of housing in the in the city of South Bend. 
what it does do, it, it creates um, almost like a, it opens the floodgates for a higher um, 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 assessed values for homes. If we are starting to work on, if we want to work on affordable housing, if we want to put housing that is affordable for people who need a house that's below 200000 we're not doing a very good job of figuring out what this is going to do once developers or investors start putting in these sorts of um, um, investments in, into neighborhoods. I am not against what Mr. Fair is doing. But you, we have to understand about the health of the city of South Bend as it relates to affordability for housing. And if we're not figuring this out right now, we're going to price each and every one of us out of this community. I'm talking about the people on council because we're not going to be able to support $300,000 homes. We're not going to be able to support rents that are $1,000, $1,500 a month. I know I can't pay it. I'm sure most of South Bend cannot pay it. And that's what we're looking at right now. I've invited all of you to affordable housing uh, town halls. We will resume back in February. But there is a, a understanding that we have to have when we're legislating, when we're improving or working to improve our community. There is another side to this coin. And it deals with how the real estate market behaves here in South Bend, Indiana, and who will be able to uh, participate and who are who's going to be shut out as well. So I, I just want to put that out there while we're you know saying yes to everything. I say yes to Mr. Fair and his project, but we need to also say yes to those who cannot participate at this level financially. Thank you, Mr. Thank Davis. You. We appreciate it. Thank you. Um, any other council members would like to have any statements? Uh, we, uh, we got uh, Troy Warner from the district. Troy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just want to commend Mr. Fair. Um, I know he has spent uh, months and months um, putting together a design, getting feedback from the community, changing the design, getting more feedback and changing the design again has been to the neighborhood meetings, has met with the church uh, across the street and has knocked on doors and uh, want to thank him for uh, all of that effort. Uh, about a year ago, Mr. Fair was here. I, I, I think we were talking about tax abatements and I asked him uh, kind of his thoughts on tax abatements and uh, he, he gave kind of an answer that said that uh, when he takes on an abatement, he sees he his company and the city as a partner in investing in the city. And uh, he's kind of approached this with that same way as a partner uh, with the community. And I want to thank him for that. Counts uh, Vice President Nesigowski. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I would just like to say uh, thank you for the presentation. Thank you for investing 22 to 25 million dollars into the community and providing housing, much needed housing. Um, but thank you for setting what I'm going to call the gold standard for presentations. Um, you know, I also sit on the plan commission and I see a lot of presentations by a lot of developers or people wanting to to build and do things in our community. And you went above and beyond in the presentation. And what was most impressive with me was engaging uh, the neighborhoods, the, the churches, the Robinson Center, going back and making sure that you met the needs of the residents as well as a positive development. So I just felt that I had to say that um, because I was very impressed by the, the presentation. And thank you for investing into our community. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councilman Eli Wax. Thank you. I don't have much to add beyond what my colleagues have stated. I just wanted to thank the petitioner for his previous and continuous investments in the city of South Bend. And uh, as colleagues have mentioned, um, it's always wonderful when a developer is really trying to suit the project to what the neighborhood needs rather than the other way around. So thank you again. 
there's another hand and I don't know whose hand that is. Chair Lee, it's myself, uh, Councilwoman okay. Rachel Tomas Morgan. Yes. Um, I just add gratitude. Um, uh, similar comments that uh, previous council members have already stated. Um, I just want, I, I really do want to praise Mr. Fair and the group uh, for their high responsiveness to the neighbors um, adjusting their plans. Going from five stories to four stories is no small sacrifice. And so I, um, uh, I thank you for the level of engagement that um, that you um, that you went forth in in this project, and thank you for investing in um, in the community and in this particular part of the city and um, building critical housing that we know is needed across across the city. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any any other council members? Um, council um, co Councilwoman White said it earlier. This is the gold standard. I, I think it makes a difference when uh, you engage everybody when you're coming into a neighborhood and taking a piece of land that probably would have sat vacant for a long time and investing twenty two to twenty five million dollars is a great undertaking and. Uh, engaging the community, getting the feedback from the people, making the adjustments, being a partner. That's what it's all about. And so again, thank you very much and uh, look forward to this project. I will now entertain a motion regarding Bill 141-21. I move to send the bill to the full council with a favorable recommendation. I I second. Second. All right, it's been um it's been it's been motion in favor uh, um clerk jones please read the please call the roll for bill 141-21 yes council member warner aye council member wax aye council member white aye council member tomas morgan aye council member hammond aye vice president niskoski Aye. Council Member Davis. Aye. Council Member Lee. Aye. President McBride. Aye. Nine eyes. All right. Bill 141, 141-21 be sent to the full council with a favorable recommendation. Now we have to accept the substitute bill for Bill 01-22. Clerk Jones. So moved. Second. Clerk Jones, Council will you call the roll? Yes. Council Member Wax? Aye. Council Member White? Aye. Council Member Tomas Morgan? Aye. Council Member Hammond? Aye. Vice President Niskoski? Aye. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lee? Aye. Council Member Warner? Aye. President McBride? Aye. Nine ayes. All right. Is there a committee report? I, I need to read it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Uh, Mike Jones, will you give Bill, substitute Bill 01 22, a second reading? Yes. An ordinance. Wait, public hearing on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, appropriating $1,910,000 from South Bend's American Rescue Plan Fund number 263 for premium pay for eligible employees performing essential work pursuant to federal guidelines under the American Rescue Plan Act. Is there a committee report? <clears throat> yes, Chair. Um, this was this bill was heard uh, in front of the Personnel and Finance Committee today, and it was given a favorable recommendation to the Committee of the Whole. Is the petitioner present? And I ask that you state your name and your address and share with us key points regarding the bill that's before us. 
right, thank you, Chair Lee, uh, Dan Parker, City Controller. My office is on the 12th floor of the County City Building. Um, I will run through quickly the, the presentation that we went through in committee this afternoon um, and, and hit the high points of the bill, and then definitely be very happy to answer any questions uh, that, that council members may have. Um, so this bill 01-22 um, is the administration's proposal for using a portion of the American Rescue Plan money that was allocated to the city in 2021 uh, to recognize those employees that were on the front lines during the pandemic where, when many of us uh, were at home and, and worked from home teleworking. Um, a significant number of city employees uh, were in person and, and made sure that the city kept running, that our residents were kept were, were kept safe, um, and that our drinking water was kept clean, and that streets were paved uh, and 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 uh, plowed, uh, and all those things. So uh, this bill is uh, proposing to provide a one-time premium pay to those employees that were on the front lines um, uh, during the pandemic. Um, as we talked about in committee this afternoon, the first step that we went through to uh, to propose this bill was to figure out which employees would qualify under the federal guidelines uh, for this premium pay. Um, and the, uh, init the, the initial numbers came back. Uh, we used an eligibility period of March 2020 through May 2021 um, to determine who might be eligible for this premium pay. The reason why that time period was chosen was March 2020 is when the mayor issued a uh, directive to all city employees who could work from home uh, to do so. A and then May 2021 is when that directive was fully lifted and, and city employees, all city employees were allowed to return uh, to work on a full time basis. So during that time period, those uh, those who could work from home largely were working from home. And so that's why that time period was chosen. Um, and during that time period, about 1600 individual employees worked from the city. Um, it, it was immediately evident that all sworn firefighters, all sworn police officers, and all sworn teamsters would would be um, would meet the criteria of the or all teamsters would meet the criteria of uh, the federal guidelines. Um, those were employees that were interacting with the public, interacting with coworkers on a daily basis, keeping us safe, keep making sure that our city kept uh, kept running, um, and uh, were were exactly the types of, of employees that the, these guidelines were designed to uh, to benefit uh, through this premium pay. On the non bargaining side, um, we did go through a process to try and identify which employees uh, meet the the criteria for the federal guidelines. Um, and determined that 208 of the 863 uh, non-bargaining employees met those criteria, um, which I'll run through now quickly. Uh, the first criterion in, um, in the federal guidelines was eligible workers um, in those workers that were needed to maintain continuity of operations of critical infrastructure assets. Um, so I highlighted some of the uh, sectors or occupations that apply to the city. Um, as you can see, one of the highlighted uh, sectors is all state, local, or tribal government workforce. Um, so all city employees were potentially eligible for this premium pay. But the second step in, in the determination of premium pay was determining whether an, an eligible worker performed essential work, which the federal government decide, de defined as work that is not performed while teleworking from a residence and work, work which involves in regular in-person interactions with the public, patients, or coworkers of the individual. Um, so this is where um, uh, a lot of the conversations around which, uh, which non-bargaining employees would receive the, the premium pay took place is whether that non-bargaining employee was required to come to work during the pandemic. And as we talked about in committee this afternoon, uh, many non-bargaining employees were. So there were a lot of non-bargaining employees that worked from home, but many were required to, to come into work. Um, and as we talked about, these are th everything from supervisors that worked uh, with their crews on the front lines, um, or all the way to individuals who did things that they don't normally do in their day jobs. So like for instance, uh, in, in venues, parks and arts, the recreation division, uh, many non-bargaining employees um, weren't running the normal programs that they do during during normal times um, during the pandemic. Uh, and so switched to do things like handing out food to people who needed food, who had food insecurity and, and needed uh, help during the pandemic. So um, that that is, the types of employees that that were designated on the non bargaining side. Um, the last uh, the last component of uh, the, the final rule on premium pay 
is confirming that the, the premium pay responds to workers who perform essential work um, during, during the uh, public health emergency. And the goal of this is that uh, we really want to make sure we are targeting frontline employees and those employees who, uh, whose, whose work during the pandemic uh, really was, was in person and on the front lines, um, keeping everybody safe. And there's a couple ways that we could meet this criterion. Um, one is if the earnings of the employee were less than 150% of the annual average, or average annual wage for all occupations in our county. Um, or the other one is if the employee is not exempt from the Fair Labor Standards Act overtime provisions. Um, of the 895 workers that we identified as eligible for premium pay between non-bargaining teamsters, fire, and police officers, um, 797 are non-exempt from the FLSA overtime provisions. So those, those workers were automatically qualified into this uh, targeted frontline employee um, criterion. Uh, of the of the remaining uh, 98 that were that are exempt from the FLSA overtime provisions, uh, 83 are below that that average annual wage, or 150% of that average annual wage, I should say. Um, so that that leaves uh, 15 employees who uh, who don't meet either of the criteria there, and we will submit written justification to the Department of Treasury on why those employees. Um, were performing essential work and were required to be in person. Those employees are, are managers and directors in primarily public works or venues, parks and arts who manage the critical city operations, things like solid waste, waterworks, streets, um, those types of operations dur during the pandemic and that, that management required them to work in person. Um, so they do meet the criteria there. Uh, from those 895 employees, we determined or are proposing a, a total payment of just over 1.9 million. Um, that is based on uh, a maximum of $2,500 for each officer, uh, each police officer, 20, a maximum of $2,500 for each firefighter, uh, a maximum of $2,000 for each member of the Teamsters, and a maximum of $2,000 for the, the designated non-bargaining employees. Um, as, as we talked about in committee, uh, the reason why I said that as a, a maximum of is that they those numbers and those, those bonuses would be prorated based on the number of months that the employee worked between March 20, 2020 and May 2021. So if, if the employee was hired six months after March 2020, six months into the pandemic, uh, they would receive a prorated amount of, of that of that maximum number. And on the non-bargaining side, uh, non-bargaining employee uh, bonuses were additionally prorated by the percent of time that, that they were required to be physically at work. So if it wasn't a requirement that they be at work 100% of the time, then, then their, um, their, their amount was reduced accordingly. Uh, the only additional criterion that was put in place by the city was that we required that the, um, uh, that the employee be employed by the city as of December 31st, 2021, or have retired or passed away uh, between October 20 or October 1st and December 31st. Um, so those are those are the only other two criteria. Um, and from that, we uh, calculated an overall payment of just over 1.9 million for those 895 employees. So we are asking council to approve this um, in recognition of the just incredible and amazing work that were done by our frontline employees during this difficult time. Um, and I am happy to answer any questions that council members may have. Are there any, are there any questions from council members? Councilman Davis. Thank you. Um, Mr. Parker, why wasn't this council given um, the position titles of those who are either not getting the money or those who are getting the money uh, for their dedication to this city? In terms of the individual titles? Yes, sir. We, we, we can provide that information. Um, we didn't just because we didn't provide all of the information. This is just an overview, but we do have that um, if, if that's something that council is interested in. Well, I always think that it, they were just talking about the gold standard presentations earlier. I always believe in thing. <clears throat> excuse me, when there is monies that are going to this cause or that cause or whatever it is, it really needs to be spelled out because I can tell you 
after this money is approved, because we're going to approve it. I'm going to support this. Right. I can't stop it. I think it's a great idea that, you know, frontline workers get their just due. Um, that's what the money from the federal government says um, that there are going to be employees that are going to feel like they were slighted because someone um, where you're sitting at felt like that they didn't deserve it because of these things. Um, I really think that the city council, this common council deserves to know who is actually working for the city and who uh, is actually getting uh, their just due or who isn't getting their just due. It could be either or, but I really believe that we need to know what's going on. Just not some overview that's really quickly read over and asked, you know, can we, you know, support um, this million plus dollar initiative so thank you for for that um on the uh comment of whether there will be any pushback we did address that briefly um in committee um and the the determination of who especially on the non-bargaining side would receive this uh payment um because on the fire police and teamsters side it was uh, across the board um on the on the non-bargaining side um fortunately the uh, criterion of was the employee required to work in person um, is fairly objective. Um, it's not a matter of did the employee deserve this or even is the, what the employee does essential because everything that the city does is essential. Um, it's, it's, it's really was the, was the employee required to put themselves out there and work in person uh, and subject themselves to the hazards of working in person during the pandemic? Sure, but I don't know that. You told me that. That's why I asked for um, detailed information. I'm not saying that you're not truthful in what you're doing, but I'm only going off of what you say. There is no other information that says anything different or goes along with what you say. Uh, Councilman Davis, we, we want to make sure that we understand the rules of engagement, that this is, is, is not a time for debate. No, no one's debating Mr. Uh, Lee. He asked the question, I responded. He made a statement, I responded. I asked the question first, I responded. I'm allowed to respond to the questions that's being asked. Well, um, thank you, Mr. Parker, for, for answering it. Um, are there any other council people? Uh, Councilman Eli Wax. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just making sure that I understand this correctly, where your current estimates based on your formula is 1.9, um, but the appropriation, what, what, well, let me, uh, actually, I'll ask it as a question. If it comes to light that a employee, for whatever reason, was miscalculated or um, it seems that they, at first glance, they weren't eligible, but then based on this criteria, they should be eligible. Um, do we need to go back and fix that or will this this bill provide so that it could be fixed up later? Yes, thank you for the the, the question. Um, there is a little bit of wiggle room in there. Um, as you can see, the, the total calculation right now is a little bit under what the appropriation amount is. Um, not a whole lot, um, but there is a, whole, a little bit of wiggle room there. Um, and, as well, we have um, obviously so, so we can uh, pay out of the employee's normal labor account as well, if that's something that we want to do. If there is a significant number of employees, which we don't anticipate because a, a lot of work went into trying to determine this list, but if there is a significant number of employees that we just miscalculated um, or are owed money that we that we didn't factor into this, uh, this, this number, then we absolutely will come back to the council and say, hey, Mia culpa, we 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 screwed up and we didn't we didn't uh, calculate this correctly. And can you uh, please please appropriate a little bit more money? But uh, as I said, a lot of work went into to calculating these numbers. A lot of engagement with the departments, um, a lot of engagement uh, with the unions, um, and and we feel fairly confident in, in the numbers. So just to reiterate, if it's a smaller, like you know, a few employees, there's there's enough room within this appropriation that you'll be able to clean that up in the back end should that come up. Yes. Thank you. All right, any other council members? Yes, uh, what about the 911 operators? Did I miss that? I, have a, I had a sick child this afternoon, so I couldn't come to the committee here and I'm sorry. 
But um, my, I do have a question about the 911, 911 operators. Thank you, Councilman Davis. Uh, the 911 operators are county employees, not city employees. Okay. So, um, if, if they were to be paid, it would be through the county. Thank you, sir. All right. Is there you no? Know, I see another hand. Uh, it, it doesn't tell me who it is. So. It's still Mr. Davis's hand. There it's gone. Okay. All right. Thank you. At this time, we'll go to the public hearing portion. Clerk Jones, is there anyone from the public wishing to speak in favor of Bill 0122 or opposition? Um, yes, we have uh, three that have expressed interest in speaking in favor. The first uh, being Gerard Warnock. Mr. Warnock, uh, could you unmute yourself and state your name and your address for the record, please? Jared Warnock, Teamster Circle 364, 2405 East Edison Road, South Bend, Indiana. I'm speaking in support on behalf of the city Teamsters who provided and continue to provide the services to the residents of the city of South Bend. We appreciate the recognition from the leadership that is th that as much stalled during that period and still is stalled, we continue to forge ahead. We appreciate your support for the for the American Rescue Plan COVID premium pay ordinance. Thank you very much. We have another person whose name is Gray or G R E. Okay, and then we have we have two more. We have um, Mr. Jason Bonicki. Uh, Mr. Bonicki, if you would um, unmute yourself and state your name and your address for the record, please. Uh, Jason Bonicki, thirty-eight twenty-two Ford Street, South Bend, Indiana. Um, obviously, you know these are the folks who came to work every day and provide the essential services. Uh, this is something that is long overdue. You know, basically, if you count going back to the Buddha judge administration with Mueller essentially being one extended administration, we're looking at 11 years of these folks getting 2%, two percent, two and a half on the high side raises, while the administrators who all worked from home during this have routinely received double digit raises and seen their pay far outstripe that of the average working individual in the city. So this kind of recognition for those folks who actually did the work and and put themselves at risk to make sure we had everything we need to do in the pandemic is something that we need to do more of and need to continue to do as a city going forward. Okay. Next we have Allison Minsberg. Uh, Ms. Minsberg, if you would unmute yourself and state your name and your address for the record, please. Thank you. My name is Allison Minsberg. I live at 2633 Arrowhead Drive in South Bend. And I am also in support of this bill. Um, I did want to kind of follow up with Henry Davis Jr.'s comments, and I hope that this bill does include 311 administrators who set up um, home offices so that they could continue to work while it was at home. That was still, I'm sure, a great um, difficulty for them. And I do hope it includes code officers in the field. It was a little unclear. Uh, Dan Parker mentioned that people who expose themselves to others, um, so it wasn't clear if that included people who would be in cars by themselves or not. I would hope that that would be the case, though, that they would be included in that pay. And then also it was unclear people who were on rotating schedules to minimize their time in the office, if they would get that hazard pay if they were in the office part time or if that's only if they were in the office full time. But otherwise, I am in support of this bill and I look forward to more clarification in the future. Thank you. Okay, that exhausts our list of those that are in support of the bill. Okay. Um, is is there anybody that's in opposition? I do not see anyone from the public in opposition of this bill. Uh, uh, petitioner, do you want to address any of those statements from from people who are supporting it or? Uh, sure. Thank you, and and thank you to everybody who um, who spoke in support of the bill. Um, I couldn't agree more. Um, just to the specific questions from Ms. Meinsberg, um, 
uh, I, in terms of 311 and, and code, um, I don't know offhand whether those are included in the numbers. Um, but I can say in, in terms of your last question of whether people who were only in the office a portion of the time would be eligible on the non-bargaining side, yes. Um, so we did uh, prorate the, the payment based on the portion that they were required to come into the into the building. So a, a great example would be uh, people who worked um, at, at the building department, for example, in customer service. Um, they sort of rotated in um, to try and minimize contact, but we were, were required to be um, in person at various points. Um, and, and the amount of the payment is prorated based on the amount of time that they were required to be in. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Parker. At this point, the public hearing bill, um, public hearing portion on Bill 01-22 is now closed. Uh, council members, um, are there any council members that would like to make a statement regarding Bill 10-22? I got my hand up. I see you. Troy Warner, please. Uh, thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, I, I very much in support of this. It's overdue. Um, you know, we all we made commitments uh, in bargaining last year with uh, with the unions and need to hold those commitments and uh, um, take care of those employees that uh, took care of the city and our residents uh, during the pandemic. And I, I'm supportive of this. Thank you. Um, Vice President Nagoski. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, just kind of echoing what um, Councilman Warner said, we did make some commitments during the bargaining process with Teamsters, firefighters, and our police officers who are truly, truly on the front lines during this pandemic, and which we are still in a pandemic. Um, but certainly the support of all of the city, as Mr. Parker stated, is essential to running and keeping the city going for essential services, getting your trash picked up, you know, being able to pick up that phone and talk to somebody when you need them, code enforcement issues. Um, I mean, just so many things out there. Um, and I want to say thank you to all of the city employees uh, that continue to work and support our community. Um, it, it's very important, and I fully support this bill. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Any other council members? Again, I support this this um, uh, because it is important to take a moment and and appreciate those um, uh, those who are on the front line, those who are essential workers, those who kept going, those who kept the city moving forward. It's important, and so this rescue money was for that, and and it's good to see that it's going to the people that deserve it. So, with that being said. I will now entertain a motion regarding make a motion to make a motion to send bill 1-21 to the full council with a favorable recommendation. Second. I would like what? to second that motion, but it's the substitute bill. The and substitute and it's 1-22. 1-22. Yes. Uh -huh. I messed it up. Mm -hmm. what? No problem. Council member White and I jointly make a motion to <laughs> substitute 1-22. Okay. Clark Jones, will you, will, you, will you call the roll, please? Yes. Council Member White? Aye. Council Member Tomas Morgan? Aye. Council Member Hammond? Aye. Vice President Nuskoski? Aye. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lee? Aye. Council Member Warner? Aye. Council Member Wax? Aye. President McBride? Aye. Nine ayes. Mm -hmm. All right. Bill 10-22 will be sent to the full council with a favorable recommendation. I will now entertain a motion to rise from the Committee of the Whole and report back to the full council. So moved. Moved. Second. Clerk Jones, please take the roll. Yes. Council Member Tomas Morgan? Aye. Council Member Hammond?
Council Member Hammond? Aye. Vice President Niskowski? Aye. Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lee? Aye. Council Member Warner? Aye. Council Member Wax? Aye. Council Member White? Aye. President McBride? Aye. Nine um, eyes. Just for the record again, before we go back in session, when we are taking vote per Robert's rule of orders, you have to be with your camera on and uh, both audio and visual on council. Council Thank President you. McBride. Yes. I have a question about that statement that you just made. Um, you say per Robert rules of order, did this body <clears throat> did this body vote on that, or is that something that's already in boilerplate? Because if that's the case, because because if that's the case, then all the votes prior to you becoming president are uh, are questionable because we didn't have that same rule over the last two years. We were. Um, I can have the refer to the parliamentarian, but that has been the case. Um, in the past since I've been on and prior to that. So I've never when heard that virtual, when you are virtual, you are to have your camera and uh, when you are voting, not when you're listening, but when you are voting, you are to have your camera and the audio on. But I could defer to the parliamentarian. Thank you, President McBride. Uh, pursuant to the uh, municipal code, Robert's rules of uh, order, uh, apply when there's no specific um, ordinance uh, covering the situation. Uh, so yes, they do apply automatically without a vote from council members. As far as the requirement of uh, being seen and uh, heard on votes, uh, pursuant to the most recent standard on attending virtual meetings, uh, you are required to be seen and heard when you vote. However, we are operating under the emergency rules uh, under the uh, governor's executive orders. So that technically does not apply to us now. Uh, if we um, if we can hear the vote, that is sufficient under those rules. Thank you. Thank you for the question and thank you for the clarification. I hope does that answer it for you? Well, I think it answer answer for everyone else. So then, my picture that's up there right now is sufficient. It suffice. Am I correct? Thank you. No, I'm asking. According I to did. the executive orders, up. Oh, I see uh, Attorney Palmer. I I was just about to say that because we're we're operating under the executive emergency orders from the governor, your photo is um, is fine. However, when we get beyond the uh, executive orders and uh, the council member wishes to appear virtually at a meeting, the vote will have to be taken with the council member uh, actually being seen, not by picture, but by a video. Absolutely, and thank you for that clarification. I just know that Robert Rules of Order presents a whole nother paradigm when we're having discussion. So thank you for responding, Bob. Well, thank you. And so that would be moving forward. His his order supersedes at this time. But in a regular meeting, we will have to um, if anyone is virtual, you would have to um, go beyond after the executive order, be virtual and be visibly seen. So thank you for that question and the clarification. At this time, uh, we are rising back to the full council. Um, we are back in session. This portion of the meeting is where bills are given a third reading and action is taken regarding bills that were heard during the Committee of the Whole. Clerk Jones, would you please give Bill 140-21 a third reading? Yes. 140-21, third reading on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, amending the zone, zoning ordinance for property located at 340 East Walter, Council Manning District Number Five in the City of South Bend, Indiana. Thank you, Councilman Lee. Is there a recommendation for the Committee of the Whole regarding Bill 140-21? Yes, Bill 140-21. Uh, 
is sent to the full council with a favorable recommendation. I will now entertain a motion regarding Bill 140-21. I would like to make a motion in reference to Bill 140-21 that it will be uh, uh, for passage. Second. Thank you. Thank you. Clerk Jones, will you call the roll, please? Yes. Councilmember Hammond? Aye. Vice President Niskoski? Aye. Councilmember Davis? Aye. Councilmember Lee? Aye. Councilmember Warner? Aye. Councilmember Wax? Aye. Councilmember White? Aye. Councilmember Thomas Morgan? Aye. President McBride? Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you. Bill 14021 has passed. Clerk Jones, will you give Bill 141-21 a third reading? Yes. 141-21, third reading on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, amending the zoning ordinance for property located at 1105, 1111, 1115, 1117, 1118, 1120, and 1121 Campaw Street, and 1116, 1124, 1125, 1128, 1132, 1133, 1134, 1135, 1136, 1137, and 1140 Corby Boulevard, Councilmanic District Number 4 in the City of South Bend, Indiana. Thank you. Councilman Lee, is there a recommendation for a committee of the whole regarding Bill 141-21? Bill 141-21 is sent to the full council with a favorable re recommendation. Thank you. I will now entertain a motion regarding Bill 141-21. I'd like to move for passage. Second. Second. Clerk Jones, will you call the roll? Yes. Um, Vice President Niskoski. Aye. Councilmember Davis. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Aye. Councilmember Warner. Aye. Councilmember Wax. Aye. Councilmember White. Aye. Councilmember Tomas Morgan. Aye. Councilmember Hammond. Aye. President McBride. Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you. Uh, Bill 141-21 has been adopted. Clerk Jones, will you give substitute Bill 01-22 a third reading? Yes. Third reading on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, appro appropriating $1,910,000 um, dollars from South Bend's American Rescue Plan Fund Number 263 for premium pay for eligible employees performing essential work pursuant to federal guidelines under the American Rescue Plan Act. Thank you. Councilman Lee, is there a recommendation for, from the Committee of the Whole regarding Substitute Bill 01-22? Yes. Uh, Substitute Bill 01-22 is sent to the full council with a favorable recommendation. I will entertain a motion regarding Substitute Bill 01-22. Move for passage. Second. Second. Dr. Jones, will you call the roll, please? Yes. Councilmember Davis. Aye. Councilmember Lee. Aye. Councilmember Warner. Aye. Councilmember Wax. Aye. Councilmember White. Aye. Councilmember Tomas Morgan? Aye. Councilmember Hammond? Aye. Vice President Niskowski? Aye. President McBride? Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you. Substitute Bill 01-22 has been adopted. Now on to resolutions. This is the portion of council meeting where Common Council hears bills filed as proposed resolutions. The title of each proposed resolution is read by the clerk and report from the committee chairperson of the standing committee to which the bill was referred to for an advisory review and recommendation is then given. A 
Can I entertain a motion that resolution 22-2 and 22-6 are read together. So moved. so moved. Second. Clerk Jones. Yes. Council Member Lee. Aye. Council Member Warner. Aye. Council Member Wax. Aye. Council Member White. Aye. Council Member Tomas Morgan. Aye. Council Member Hammond? Aye. Vice President Niskoski? Aye. Council Member Davis? Aye. President McBride? Aye. Nine ayes. Thank, thank you. Um, at this time, do we have a presenter? I have to read it. Good evening, uh, members of the council. My name is Santiago Garces. I am the executive director of the Department of Community Investment. I'm gonna Excuse put me. on share my screen with you. Oh, wait a second, actually. Excuse me. Sorry for interrupting, but we have to read the e resolution right. first. Thank you so much. <laughs> Dr. Dillon? Yes. So I'm reading 2202 and 2206. Yes. Thank you, Bob. Okay. A resolution of the Common Council, the C this 2202, a resolution of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, designating certain areas within the City of South Bend, Indiana, commonly known as intersection of Calvert Street and Renewable Drive, South Bend, Indiana, 46613, an economic revitalization area for purposes of a nine-year real property tax abatement for Jim Farm South Bend, LLC. 2206, a resolution of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, designating certain areas within the City of South Bend, Indiana, commonly, commonly known as Intersection Calvert Street and Renewable Drive, South Bend, Indiana, 46613, an economic revitalization area for purposes of a five-year personal property tax abatement for Jim Farms, South Bend, LLC. Thank you so much. Is there a presenter? And would you please state your name and address? Yes, Council President. Hi, my name is Santiago Garces. I am the Executive Director of the Department of Community Investment with offices in the 14th floor of the City County Building. Um, I'll be presenting with Angelina Bilo, who's our uh, Director of Business Development. And we also have, I think, the petitioners um, just as a point of reference, both um, the, there's four bills, but there's really in some ways like two phases of the same of like related projects. Um, the real property uh, side of things is for the actual physical building side of the, of things, and the personal property is um, the equipment uh, that that is necessary for the investment. Um, we're really excited to share with you. Um, this is a major investment in the city. Actually, I think like one of the largest in at least that I can remember in, in recent years, um, almost over $260 million and about 185 new jobs and 25 jobs retained. Um, these are jobs that uh, pay above average of what uh, people in our area make. I think both uh, make over uh, $24 an hour. And it's giving an opportunity for people that um, might not necessarily want to go down um, a traditional college route, if you will, to be able to engage in meaningful work and uh, working in the cutting edge of how uh, food's going to be produced. And uh, we're really excited to see this level of commitment from um, investors that have already built the, the first phase and are interested in expanding. So. Uh, I'll turn it over to Angelina, although I'm going to be, we figured out, I think, the, the audio piece, so hopefully it works. Um, Angelina? Uh, yes, uh, Angelina Bila, uh, Director of Business Development, uh, 14th floor, County Building. Uh, yes, uh, this is uh, one of the largest investment project, potential project here in South Bend. Uh, as Santi said, more than 260 million 
would be committed to a, a project by two petitioners, uh, GM uh, Farms uh, South Bend and uh, Green Leap. So we're starting with uh, uh, GM, our, uh, GM Farms South Bend. So uh, this is a, a, a this company uh, will be owned by uh, one of the largest fully integrated high tech uh, greenhouse company in North America. The name of the company Red Sun Farms. So company located in Canada and the uh, uh, it has a presence in uh, three countries. Uh, United States, uh, Canada, and uh, um, Mexico, and also in uh, in Japan. So uh, we would like to share with you a short video of Red Farm, so company which will which is considering to bring the business uh, to South Bend through GM Farms South Bend. So. The monarch butterfly is spectacular, not merely for its undeniable beauty, but for its commitment in knowing what it'll become, and for its scale in making all of North America its home. At Red Sun, we believe it's no coincidence that the monarch butterfly begins and ends its journey in our farm regions. You see our commitment to quality, flavor, and speed, and our scale three countries and thousands of miles reflects not only the life of the monarch but also our beliefs at red sun we believe produce should arrive to the plate fast fresh and flavorful we believe the company that grows produce should be responsible for every tomato cucumber and pepper from seed to plate and it's for those reasons we've designed a multinational vertically integrated system that ensures rapid access to market with quality and flavor control measures throughout We've closed the gap between grower, retailer, and consumer. We're committed to continuous improvement because we know that opportunity can be found in every detail. So let's have a look inside Red Sun Farms and see how we've become a leader in the North American greenhouse industry. flavor begins long before picking the perfect vegetable. At Red Sun, we research the flavor and growth profile of every seed we propagate to ensure that only the very best are brought to market. Our propagation system is both vast and cutting edge. And by taking control at the very beginning, we ensure quality control throughout. perfect product in a controlled environment is both a science and an art, and we take pride in both. Our greenhouses in Mexico, Virginia, and in Canada are not merely grow houses, but rather state-of-the-art production facilities led by teams of passionate growers with years of experience. These dedicated teams manage the delicate balance between light, temperature, and other variables to ensure every plant is healthy and productive all year round. In our controlled environment, science and nature work hand-in-hand -hand to produce dozens of varieties of tomatoes, peppers, and cucumbers. All non-GMO and all traceable. Like all of our products, our organics are always within our caring grasp. From seed selection to delivery, traceability and safety is paramount at Red Sun. There's a crucial window of time between the moment a product is picked and when it's placed on a grocer's shelf. At Red Sun, we know that period needs to be brief and safely managed. It starts with our cutting edge packaging process, which ensures traceability and is our opportunity to showcase Red Sun varieties, including our Artisan series and our organic line. From that moment on, our logistic team focuses on ensuring our products take the most direct path between our facilities and the grocer's shelves. 
But the story of Red Sun doesn't stop at the grocery store. Our journey continues into restaurants and kitchens across North America and Japan. It weaves into the healthy lifestyles of families from all walks of life and circles back to the communities where we all live, which is why we continue to live up to our responsibility as a community partner, distributing and donating greenhouse produce to the less fortunate and actively supporting organizations that lobby for a healthier community by way of education and food safety. So the next time you see a majestic monarch butterfly, let it be a reminder of the commitment the artisans here at Red Sun hold towards growing the most flavorful produce and of our commitment to deliver throughout North America and Japan. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you. So uh, currently uh, in, uh, in the States, Red, uh, Red Sun Farms has uh, only one uh, facility in Virginia uh, on uh, 40 acres and the largest yeah the largest plants are in mexico and also in canada so um if a uh, uh, petitioner uh, uh, made a decision to build their plan here in south bend uh, it will be a facility on one, 100 acres, meaning that this would be the largest facility in the United States. Uh, the staff is uh, proposing a real property tax abatement for nine years. So uh, the staff uh, reviewed a uh, petition and uh, all zone and uh, building requirements have been met. The uh, estimated private investment uh, in a new construction uh, 60 million. So uh, at this uh, facility, a company will grow and uh, distribute tomatoes and strawberries. Also, since it's a new project, uh, the company estimates that they will hire uh, 110 uh, new employees with the uh, average wage $29.77. Uh, uh, it's also estimated for that for the nine years of uh, tax abatement, 2.5 million uh, uh, taxes uh, will be paid. Um, so for the second portion, uh, which is uh, personal property, the staff is recommending five years uh, tax abatement for equipment, uh, estimated private investment, 118 million. So it mainly uh, robotics sensor and uh, video systems uh, to control, regulate processing, growing, harvesting, and production. Uh, so um, with, uh, you know, after uh, tax abatement, the full taxes for both the, the, the full uh, taxes of uh, on a uh, real property and personal property would be for real property it's uh, estimated annual taxes 1.2 uh, million and for uh, personal property around 800,000 again you know this is just a estimated amount uh, we also have today representative uh, of the company, Paul Mandronardi. So, Paul, please, you know, feel free to add uh, anything else to, you know, my presentation about the project. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, yeah, Paul Mastronardi here, uh, 1577 County Road 34, Kings, Ontario. Uh, a little bit of background uh, information on, on the facility, third generation greenhouse distributor here in uh, North America. Uh, based out of Kingsville, Ontario, uh, looking to expand our footprint here in uh, the United States and uh, Indiana is one of the locations that we are currently looking at. I think that, that uh, yeah, I think that that concludes our our presentation. If you have questions, I think that the later part of the presentation will include the other two bills. Thank you so much, both uh, Santi Garces and Angelina Billo. We appreciate that. Um, before I turn to council, I just want to make the statement to uh, during the public portion. Um, 
Members of the public are invited to address the council. We ask that you please give your name and address and comments on the bill. If you have any questions, it will be addressed by the presenter during their rebuttal. Each member of the public is limited to five minutes with those speaking in favor going first, followed by those in opposition. Then a five minute rebuttal for the presenter of the bill uh, may be given. At this time, I'll turn to my council colleagues to see if you have any questions. I see a hand up, but I don't know whose hand that is. Council Member Davis. Thank you. Absolutely. Davis. Yep, and thank you. Um, I'm going to say that I am in full support of all three of these bills before they all get read and, and, and discussed. I think that this is a huge opportunity. The question I have is, uh, then this is for Mr. Uh, Santi Garces. Um, who is going to be um, the person that's going to um, hold this abatement accountable over the years that i've uh, served on council we've always have given out abatements and every time we've given out abatements somebody says that they're going to bring two thousand jobs well after two three four five years we only see 500 and that company has never uh asked why or what happened is so i'm asking who is going to maintain oversight over this abatement sure i'd be happy to um share that um the ab all tax abatements uh, require a yearly a submission from the people that have been granted a, a tax abatement uh those are the cf ones there's also another process that happens in parallel through the uh, county assessor's office uh which is the one that coordinates the actual payment of of taxes. Um, every year we remind all petitioners that they need to submit this compliance information, which also includes some questions that um, uh, from, a, from a survey that, that we require that they submit. Um, and the information for all active tax abatements gets presented to council and you, uh, it's in your hands to decide whether a tax abatement is out of compliance. And um, again, for the most part, they, as we mentioned, they, we focus on making sure that they, that the companies are investing the, the monies that they said that they're going to be investing. Um, and obviously like things like the actual assessment of the property and whatnot fall outside of our jurisdiction. They're managed by the county assessor. Um, but we share with you all of the data about like what um, has happened in the tax abatement. And then it is the pleasure of the council to decide whether they grant the waiver if uh, someone's out of compliance or um, so it's it's in it's in your hands. We compile the information that goes to council every every year. So is that the full council all nine like we're meeting right now or is that a committee? I believe that it goes to the full council every year. Around June time is when when that uh, report is as well, then that's been the practice. Uh, I think that that's always been, been the practice. Council President, do you know who uh, is it all nine members or is it the committee for community investment? When they come back and file, do a report and update, they present it back to the full council in June. But if no, there's anything, is that what you're asking or no? No, ma'am. I'm asking who is precise over the information once it's actually delivered to the council. It has to go to a committee. It should be the Community Investment Committee. So we're going to depend on the Community Investment Committee, the chair of that committee, to make sure to ensure that these numbers are up to par. No, I would I would think in um, that when the report is given, that I would hope that we collectively as a council will look at that and make sure they're in co compliance. And I also think that um, if there's anything that you would like a report or for me to do um, prior to or uh, to get in the information that you need, um, I'm willing to do whatever that ask is. So I'm not quite sure what you're um, asking. Well, but I the practice has me. been, and, and, and I just need some clarity here, unless this has changed. The, does the committee that preside over community investment is the actual committee that will define exactly what happens with this abatement and any other abatement, to be honest with you, 
uh, once the information is collected or is it like a nine member council, which it is, says, hey, some one member says, well, the abatement is um, not being met. We need to have a meeting. Well, another member of the council out of nine may say, well, I think that they're doing a good job. So I, I, I'm trying to figure out who actually has the authority over these abatements. Let me turn, uh, Councilman Davis, if you don't mind. I'm sorry, someone's saying something. Sorry to interrupt, President McBride. I'm happy to help answer any questions if you'd like. I can have you uh, give some input and then I'll turn to uh, Bob as well to see if we can better answer your question, Mr. Davis. Thank uh, you, President McBride. I just want to, um, and Mr. Garces and Ms. Billow can help refresh my memory, but this past um, year, the staff brought before us um, at first in community investment, and then it, it certainly went to the full council for decisions when there were ab abatements that um, that uh, re were requesting waivers. So if I'm understanding your question correctly, your concern is about um, is about tax abatements um, companies that are requesting waivers. Um, and so that's um, just this past year we we addressed um, several of those and and council voted on those. It went first to community investment and then to the full council as um, as business typically does. Mr. Davis, does that does that clarify anything at all of what you're asking? No, because that's not what I understood happened in the past. The information went, that's why the question is out there, because now it's the full council. Um, how I understood it in the practice uh, since I've been around, it always went to that committee that that department was under. And so as we move forward, that committee got the information. I'm not saying the rest of the council did not get the information, but that committee and that committee chair really got the information and they directed and redirected what occurred with that information, especially when a, a company was out of compliance. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in hearing what uh, Mr. Palmer has to say. Yep, I would uh, refer to him, but I, I thank you, uh, uh, Chair uh, Tomas Morgan, because I recall that and I can also have the clerk's office uh, pulled that um, when we had the waivers come in front of us because that was asked and we did have to go through all of those and approve uh, those waivers. But I would ask um, for the clerk's office to resubmit the minutes that we had in June of last year with those waivers and also have Attorney Palmer chime in. Thank you, President McBride. Uh, my recollection is the same as Council Member uh, Thomas Morgan's. The reports initially go to the uh, Community Investment Standing Committee. They issue a recommendation to the uh, Council as a whole as to whether or not a waiver should be granted. And uh, it's up to the Council to determine whether or not that waiver will be granted. Uh, it's, it's not up to solely the committee. Mr. Davis, is there any other request that you? No, I, I think that's what I had stated, and thank you so much. I think that's consistent with what I was saying. Uh, it goes okay. to the committee, and then the committee directs the traffic. So thank you so much. We got it now. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any um, one else from the council um, have any comments regarding this bill? Any comments regarding 2202? I see uh, Councilman Lee. Yeah, I would just like to say that this is uh, uh, this is great. Uh, this kind of investment in our city, uh, this kind of new technology, these job opportunities, um, the amount of money that's being invested, and then the product that's being produced. Um, uh, th this is, is a win for our city. Thank you, Councilman, uh, Councilwoman. Sheila Nizgatsky. Uh, thank you, President McBride. 
Well, as a representative of the 6th District where this project will lie, I can tell you I am very excited about this uh, project. And to have a third generation farmer, Paul stated that they were, is exciting too. That shows a dedication to the craft that they have of developing food for communities. Um, this could be the largest development of its kind in the U.S. And it's going to be right here in the city of South Bend. A $260 million project. I am over the moon excited. I've been to this facility twice. I've been there with the Rum Village Neighborhood Association where they got to see how that food is, is grown and developed. Um, it cuts down on things like E. coli that he was, uh, I believe Paul was talking about or um, I forget the gentleman's other name, but it's safe food, it's fresh food, it's food that's gonna be grown locally. Um, and I'm just excited. This is cutting edge, fresh food right here in the city of South Bend. And I welcome this project to the sixth district and for the job opportunities that it's presents. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Councilwoman Tomas. Point of order. Thank yes. you, President. Are we in a session, uh, the, the part of the uh, meeting where we're asking questions or we're giving comments? I thought we were asking questions. We're at the portion of asking questions. You're absolutely correct, uh, Councilman Davis. Councilwoman Tomas Morgan, do you have a question? Um, I apologize, President McBride, I have a comment to make. So when it Thank comes you. time to comment, I can make my comment. Thank you so much. Now at this time, I don't, <coughs> I can't tell if there's any other hands raised. I don't believe so. With that being said, I will uh, turn it over to um, public portion. Um, Clerk Jones, or do you see anyone that is um, in the chat wishing to speak in favor of Bill 22-02 um, or 22-06? Clerk Jones, I believe you may be muted. Let me look in the chat and see if I see anyone. Okay, um, I see Jason Benicki that he has a comment in the chat that he would like to speak on Bill 2202 and 2206. Would you please unmute yourself and state your name and address for the record? Uh, Jason Benicki, 3822 Ford Street. Uh, well, I think this is a fantastic project. Uh, a couple of things I do want to call out. Um, I know they're talking an hour, hourly average wage of 2977, uh, but if you look at an average annual payroll of 3.9 million across 110 employees, it's actually an hour average hourly wage of closer to $17 an hour, uh, not 29. Um, and then if you look at the laborers and the technical support staff, who will make up the bulk of the employees. You're talking 1362 an hour and 2259 per hour. So I think it's key to look at, at the numbers in, in actuality, in, in what the reality of the number is. You can put on paper it's 2977. That's not what the number is according to the numbers. You know, 3.9 million divided by 110 does not equal 29.77 per hour. Uh, so who's fact checking these numbers when they publish them? Uh, second thing I'd like to call out, um, over nine years, they're paying approximately two and a half million dollars in property taxes, uh, but they need $3 million in public in infrastructure improvements to make the project work. So then you're asking the taxpayer to foot another half a million dollars uh, of that money that the company is not even paying initially to cover the initial investment in that infrastructure, let alone the ma long term maintenance of that infrastructure. You know, I get it. It's a large investment. It's it's a big number of jobs. But are you know, again, Walmart's paying 14 and 15 bucks an hour right now. We're talking 1362 to do hard labor. I don't know if that's necessarily the kind of quality job we want to be talking about. Like it's a huge home run win. You know, we all want investment. We all want more jobs. These things are important. But I think the thing is to look at the real numbers and talk about what the actuality of the situation is, you know, not just highlight the things that make it look the best. And again, also look at that aspect of how are we paying for this infrastructure today 
tomorrow and 10 years from now, if they're not even paying enough in taxes over the first nine years to pay for the initial outlay, let alone the maintenance. Um, so I think those are, are things to look at um, and maybe to dial back the percentage of the abatement to make it, you know, work for the taxpayer. You know, you can't just expect taxpayers to keep paying out, paying out, paying out for all these projects without at least the minimum infrastructure needs being paid for out of, out of the tax dollars that the project should provide. You know, we can't look at year 10 as when we hope to pay that off. By year 10, we're going to start needing to do repairs and improvements to that infrastructure. So now we've got new new dollars having to be outlaid. Uh, so I think it's important, you know, when we, we use numbers that we have somebody at least put a calculator to them when we talk about them. Again, I think it's a great project. I think, you know, we all know as the population of the world continues to grow, we need new and innovative ways to provide food sources. And the more local, the better. But again, let's just be honest about what the numbers are and what they say about the project. Thank you for your comment. And I will turn uh, to the petitioner, uh, one, to speak on the uh, payroll and two, on the infrastructure question. Paul, do you wanna? Um, oh, sorry. Yeah, uh, I thought Angela, she was reaching out to you. Wages. So you want me to start? Uh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, the regarding the jobs, the like jobs, uh, uh, most of the labor in the greenhouse is H2A under a federal program uh, that we use uh, throughout the United States. Uh, and a lot of the local uh, higher paying jobs, growers, automation uh, specialists, uh, integrated pest management scouts are all the higher paying jobs that the locals uh, will want to be more active in. Uh, regarding the infrastructure, the infrastructure uh, using supplemental lighting to grow Indiana grown product throughout the winter time at your local grocery stores is one of the key components, uh, electrical uh, and natural gas. So making those upgrades, that's going to help uh, the surrounding area get uh, more infrastructure as well uh, to, to the local area. Yeah, and I, I can address the the um, issue about the infrastructure again, like the, the, the water that's being used for growing is mostly coming from a well from the side that we've been working with our colleagues in the utilities and public works. So, um, you know, but the, the, a lot of the, the processes are focused on recycling and reusing um, material to, to be efficient. Um, and as we've discussed, a lot of the improvement in utilities and infrastructure is coming from other utilities, NEPSCO, which is our gas utility, um, AEP, which is the electric utility, um, we think that the tax abatement is really a great tool to use in this case because a lot of the challenge, um, as we talked with the petitioners, that takes um, there's a lag of time between the time that they commence construction uh, to the time that they're actually being able to generate revenue. So what the tax abatement basically does is it allows them to offset some of the those baked in costs of the taxes while they are ramping up and and building out their distribution network and 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 being able to uh, to grow. So that's why we thought that the 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 tax abatement was was a good match, and and the petitioners agreed as well. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any other questions from the public? I don't see. Um, let me see. Anyone else from the public that's expressing interest in speaking? Thank you. At this time, the public portion is closed. I will turn back to my fellow uh, counsel, uh, Mr. Davis. Yes, thank you. Uh, from what just was, uh, and I don't think anybody is against the project, okay? I think I've already given my um, a yes to it. But given what Mr. Benicki just brought up, and this is what I was talking about, compliance, it's going to be hard for them to make those marks and check those boxes if the numbers are what Mr. Um, Benicki just said, which I knew they were already when I asked the question about compliance. And so I think it will be valuable uh, for uh, Mr. Uh, Garces and his uh, uh, department to go back and put pe paper to pen or pen to paper, however you want to say that, and, and figure out what the real numbers are so that this company is successful. The last thing that we want to have is that this company is not successful in South Bend. I, I think that the, the abatement that was given is uh, based upon numbers. That's how we do it, right? 
And so if we do it that way and those numbers are not the way that they're supposed to be, then we have to go back and retool, revisit the numbers and come back with a real uh, bait, abatement that is reflective of what the company is able to do. Again, last thing we should be doing and what should we do is put a, a company in a position to fail. And right now, the way that that looks, it looks like it's a failing proposition. Thank you so much for your comments. Um, Councilwoman, uh, Vice President Niskowski. Uh, thank you. Thank you, President McBride. Um, I believe he based that number on 110 employees. And I believe in the presentation, it was stated to be between 110 and 200 jobs. So are we gonna uh, hold this up based on the exact number of jobs? Uh, I believe it was 110. I believe the presentation was 200. So if you know we're gonna go tit for tat, then let's do the calculation based on 200. I don't have a calculator. I'm sure someone here has a calculator but I don't think that a third generation family business, as uh, I understand it, uh, is gonna be set up for failure. He knows his business. He's looking at one of the largest developments in the United States right here in South Bend. So uh, I still support this ordinance. I still support this bill, both of them. Thank you, Councilman Warner. Councilman Warner, you're muted. Thank you, President. Uh, I'm excited to uh, potentially have South Bend become the uh, uh, known for fresh produce here in the Midwest. Um, as far as getting in tit for tat, there is an application. That application, if you go and dig in the packet, lays out all the specific numbers. They, they have to meet those numbers. Um, the process is if they do not meet the numbers, then they have to come and get a waiver. That waiver goes to community investment. And then it also goes to the full council where that accountability that Mr. Davis is talking about can happen. Um, I, I support this bill. I support uh, this project. Uh, Pier Green has come to Redevelopment Commission um, and uh, they've held up their end of the bargain for redevelopment commission. Um, I think this is a great project for the community. $260 million investment and 200 jobs. Um, I, I don't know if there's any developer that's uh, promised 200 jobs in uh, at least in the last 20 years. Um, so I, I'm very excited about this and uh, I look forward to casting my vote in favor. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman yeah. Tomas Morgan. Thank you, President McBride. Um, my comment is similar to uh, comments that have already been made, but um, I just want to uh, I want to say that South Bend at one point was the site of automation and innovation with um, our Studebaker automobile industry. It is absolutely exciting to think of South Bend landing this project and being the site of how food is grown into the future. Um, and to have this type of innovation and automation, um, the future of work happening here in South Bend uh, is just so exciting. Um, uh, it's it's amazing to think that in South Bend, Indiana, um, especially on a snowy, cold day like today, that we could be growing tomatoes, strawberries, lettuce, and um, you know potentially spinach year round. Um, and so uh, to the investors on this call, um, I'd like you to know that um, I support this project um, and you are most welcome to South Bend. Thank you so much, Councilman uh, Wax. Thank you, President McBride. Uh, I don't know how to follow up on those comments from uh, Council Member Thomas Morgan, but um, I, I couldn't have said it better. Um, I'm super excited about this project from both from an economic perspective and just from the fascinating and just exciting idea of, of, of what 
you guys are hoping to do here. And it seems that you have a uh, record of success in other places. And I look forward to the success here, both for our workforce and for um, the offshoots and the waves that this makes. Um, I think it's wonderful for South Bend, and I'm so pleased that you guys have selected out South Bend. Um, as it, we talked about this afternoon, uh, it appears that you guys have had multiple opportunities and other places that you could make this investment. And I'm so pleased that you chose South Bend, and I look forward to the city being a wonderful partner with you going forward. And I wish you a lot of success. Thank you so much, Councilman Lee. Thank you. Um, uh, again, uh, my colleagues have said it best. Um, you know, South Bend was known for innovation and the Studebaker plan, and there's a lot of issues and hurt from Studebaker closing down. But us going back to being a city where things are being um, in a, being an innovative city, uh, technology is is being utilized to do something that is can really make a substantial uh, impact in the in in the world and especially in our city uh 260 million dollars of investment in our city and in, in the future technology this is this is next level and this is what we want for our city and want to be known for so i support it and i'm i'm very grateful that we're we're a part of this opportunity in this moment in history for south bend Thank you so much. Um, I need to yield to ask the parliamentarian. I see the petitioner's hand up. Um, does he have an opportunity that he can uh, make a final comment? Uh, no, President McBride. Uh, the rebuttal has already taken place. This mm -hmm. is a time for yeah. comments from the, Thank uh, you. from the council. Thank you so much. All right, uh, with that, council, um, President McBride, I have a point of order question. Yes. Did did you want to hear a report from the committee? Yes, I would need to hear a uh, report from the uh, community investment. Uh, so please. For both for both of the bills. Bill twenty two o two and twenty two o six. Yes. Thank you, President please. McBride. President McBride, uh, Community Investments Committee heard both these bills, 2202 and 2206, and it comes to the full council with a favorable recommendation. Thank you so much. With that being said, my fellow council, uh, we would have to uh, vote on the bill separately, so I would like to entertain a motion for Bill 2202. I would like to make a motion that Bill 2202 uh, for adoption. Second. Clerk Jones. Yes. Council Member Warner. Aye. Council Member Wax. Aye. Council Member White. Aye. Council Member Tomas Morgan. Aye. Council Member Hammond. Aye. Vice President Nanskowski. Aye. Council Member Davis. I'm going to support this, but I'm going to hold you guys accountable. The presentation said 110. So if it's going to be that, then we need to make sure it's that or it's something different. I'm going to support it. So my vote is aye. We we'll understand accountability is coming. Thank you. President McBride. Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you. Uh, with that, um, I would like to entertain a motion for Bill 2206. I'd like to move for passage. A second. second. Clerk okay. Jones. Council Member Wax. Aye. Council Member White. Aye. Council Member Tomas Morgan. Aye. Council Member Hammond. Aye. Vice President Niskoski. Aye. Council Member Davis. Aye. Council Member Lee. Aye. Council Member Warner. Aye. President McBride. Aye. Nine ayes. 
Thank you. Um, at this time, I would like to entertain a motion that Bill 2204 and 2208 are read together. So move. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded that Bill 2204 <laughs> and 2208 be read together. Clerk Jones, would you read please resolution uh, 2204? Excuse okay, me, Preston. Don't we, have to... oh. we need to take a roll call vote on that motion. Yes, we do. Thank you so much. Okay, Council Member White. Council Member White. Aye. Council Member Tomas Morgan. Aye. Council Member Hammond. Aye. Council Member Niskowski. Aye. Council Member Davis. Aye. Council Member Lee. Aye. Council Member Warner. Aye. Council Member Wax. Aye. President McBride. Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you. Clerk Jones, would you please give reading to 22004? Okay. Do I read 2204 and 2208 one right after yes. the other? Yes. Okay. 2204, a resolution of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, designating certain areas within the City of South Bend, Indiana, commonly known as 3820 West Calvert Street, South Bend, Indiana, 46613, an economic revitalization area for purposes of a nine-year real property tax abatement for Greenleaf Hoco. 2208 is a resolution of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, designating certain areas within the city of South Bend, Indiana, commonly known as 3820 West Calvert, South Bend, Indiana, 46613, an economic revitalization area for purposes of a five-year personal property tax abatement for Greenleaf Hoco. Thank you so much. Is there a committee report? Yes, President McBride. Community Investment Committee heard both these bills this afternoon and sends them both to Council with a favorable recommendation. Thank you. Is there a presenter? And if so, would you please state your name and address for the record? Uh, yes, uh, Angelina Bila, uh, Director of Business Development, 14th floor, County Building. Um, so the company uh, Greenleaf uh, Hold Corp proposing uh, investment in uh, real and personal property. Uh, to existing facility, uh, which uh, many of you uh, had a chance to uh, visit, company are uh, planning to um, add more uh, greenhouses, uh, which will be on a, uh, 60, uh, 65 acres. So right now, uh, facility has 25 uh, employees and company is planning to retain these employees and also add another 75 jobs. Um, so with uh, 12, 12 million private investment, uh, the estimated amount of taxes for uh, nine years is uh, uh, 500,000. Um, the average uh, wage from, you know, 20, $21 to 24.34 cents. The second piece uh, is personal property. So uh, with the personal property, the investment is, the estimated investment is 68 million uh, in equipment. Uh, staff is proposing, uh, rec uh, staff's recommendation is five year personal property tax abatement. Um, you know, after uh, tax abatements, uh, real and personal, after they expire, the estimated annual taxes for Greenleaf Cold Core for real property is about 280,000 and for personal property, 500,000. Today we have a, a representative from uh, Greenleaf Holtka, 
uh, Joe uh, Maguire, uh, who is the CEO of uh, Pure Green Farms. So Joe, please feel free to add any information on uh, your, uh, uh, your plans and the project. Sure. Yeah, my name is Joe McGuire, and I'm at 3820 West Calvert Street here in South Bend. And uh, we are across from the ethanol plant, and we've been operating for just under a year. And we are producing leafy greens in a four-acre facility, our first phase. And we're proposing to build subsequent phases two, three, and four over time. And um, what we do is operate um, in the in the fresh leafy green market, which is primarily filled with suppliers from California and Arizona. So in essence, by what we're doing, because we're able to get scale out of these facilities, they're fully automated and we can control the environment and we have the ability to do this without adding any pesticides or herbicides. Um, so in essence, we are disrupting the market, the market being the legacy market of uh, fresh lettuce coming across the country from California in Arizona. And it also adds a lot of benefit to the community because it allows us to um, give a better product, a fresher product to consumers. And then there's also a lot of sustainability benefits to what we're doing. And um, those are along the lines of being able to farm with less water, um, being able to farm without pesticides and herbicides, like I mentioned, and having access to sunlight through the greenhouse and other forms of technology allow us to do this um, on a very sustainable way. Um, so yeah, we, we see a, a bright future for this. Um, it's a very competitive market. Um, it was a bold investment. The initial investment in this uh, project was a very bold investment. And um, we love our location uh, from a distribution perspective. And we've worked well with the community. We've had great meetings with um, the people in the city and the county. And um, we've been able to be active in the community. We uh, contribute to Cultivate and the Food Bank, um, probably a little bit more than we want to right at this point because we're growing a little bit more than we're actually selling. But we're on the sales side, um, we're starting to gain a lot of traction with um, some major retailers. And um, not only is, does it work for the local community, but allows us to quote unquote export to places like Chicago up to Michigan downstate Indiana, et cetera. So all that is uh, great. And I would add another point of benefit for the area that um, it attracts uh, people to the area from the industry. We get seed breeders that come in. We get uh, pest management people that come in and all different types of consultants and construction people. And so um, we, we see that as a great benefit for the area as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, at this time, I will turn to my fellow counsel and ask if you have any questions of the petitioner. I don't see anyone um, from counsel. Let me turn to uh, Clark Jones. Do you have any? Um, I will now turn it over to the public portion. Remember, public, uh, you have five minutes to um, ask a question and then the petitioner can have a rebuttal. Clerk Jones, do you see anyone in the virtual that would like to speak in favor of um, Bill 2204 or 2208? I do not see anyone from the public that is expressing interest to speak in favor of these two bills. Do you see anyone in the virtual audience wishing to speak in opposition? I do not see anybody in the virtual office uh, audience wishing to speak in opposition of these two bills. Thank you. The public portion is now closed. With that, I will turn back to my federal counsel. Do you have any comments regarding Bill 2204 or 2208? Um, let me see. I don't know whose hand went up first, but let me go to what I see in the chat. I see. Councilwoman Tomas Morgan. Thank you, President McBride. Mr. McGuire, I just want to thank you for being a part of that bold move and investment, not just moving your family here, but um, uh, really um, 
establishing this proof of concept um, in this area and that this can be a successful model. Um, I was really struck by my visit um, with you all and you were most generous with your time. I think we took two hours and you um, answered all of my questions and uh, my interrogations, but I was struck in particular to um, about um, um, labor and and in our conversation about your workers, um, how hard your workers are and the kind of skill development that you invest in them. Um, and so this is, if I recall our conversation, you were saying that this is a, a workforce that we need to develop, um, you know, these kinds of growers. Um, and so that's a real exciting opportunity for South Bend is growing that kind of workforce um, here in our community. And not only that, but that people in this industry, um, you gave me some great examples during the tour of people who kind of start um, start on the front line and can uh, can develop skills and grow. So there's a pathway of promotion in this industry as well. So I'm just uh, adding some more um, sh and sharing with other council members what I learned and uh, and what I was so impressed by. Uh, thank you for being here in South Bend and look forward to continued growth. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman White. Yes, I was just like to, to thank the developers, the petitioners for um, open your doors and to allow us to come in to do the tour. It was very, very informative. And as we begin to look at the next stage of development for our city, it's going to be technology and innovation. And what I was able to witness has will open that door for us to think differently, to react differently, but most importantly, to see our economy from a different perspective. So thank you so much, and I look forward to, for some more letters. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Councilman Warner. <clears throat> thank you, President McBride. Uh, Mr. McGuire, uh, I, I commend you and thank you for coming to our city. Uh, your facility mm -hmm. is a diamond. Um, it's amazing visiting out there. I've been out there twice, and even that second visit was I was still in awe by uh, the, the grow process. Um, and really it is, as you discussed in the tour, it, it is the future with the, the change in the environment, uh, with fires out west and change in climate. Um, we're struggling to find new places to grow these crops. Uh, they can't be grown as easily as they could be uh, out in Southern California and Northern Mexico. And then uh, th there's another stat. You told me uh, that you know to grow that three acres, um, if if you were to put it out of land, would take uh, 20 times that amount. Um, mm -hmm. And so we're we're able to uh, use the land much more efficiently um, in your, your facility. Uh, it, it it and it stuns me that nobody knows that you're there on the west side of South Bend, growing two million pounds of lettuce per year. Um, we need to get that message out. And uh, I, I, I support your vision to turn all 300 acres out there into uh, greenhouses. And uh, let's let's feed the whole Midwest out of the west side of South Bend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Councilwoman Vice President Sheila Niskotsky. Oh, thank you, President McBride. And thank you, Mr. McGuire. Uh, my fellow council members, I think, uh, put it pretty eloquently on anything else I could really add to that. Um, the food industry, this is like a billion dollar industry, multi-billion dollar industry a year. Um, and to have that opportunity here in South Bend for you to make that bold investment, move your family here and donate to places like Cultivate in the food bank. Cultivate is a wonderful facility. Um, I, I just, I'm, I'm a big fan of that. So you're also feeding our community for people in need. Um, so I just echo all the comments from my fellow council members, and I thank you for choosing South Bend. I thank you for choosing the West Side and for making this bold investment. Thank you. 
Thank you, um, Councilman Lee. Yes, thank you, uh, President McBride. Uh, again, the, the the echo. I echo the sentiment of all of my colleagues. One of the things that I thought was a very interesting thing is that, the, you know, the the pumps over there that pumps water to the ethanol plant. Um, they are are using using those pumps, and it helps with the water over in that area from being mm -hmm. a flood zone, and so um that's a great benefit for the people over in that area and and then the way that they recycle in the water and and and, and all of that um this is truly the wave of the future um and and as everyone has said it's on the west side of south bend west of the river huge investment and um we get a get a chance to be a partner with you and um helping to grow this so that it can be something that transformed the Midwest and the country and the world. And so thank you for investing in South Bend. Thank you. Thank you and Councilman Wax. Thank you so much. I'm not going to add much, but I just want to thank you again, Mr. McGuire, for um, your investments and appreciate your continued investment into the city of South Bend. And I hope you continue to be successful and I appreciate your partnership with the city. Thank you. Thank you, and Councilman Davis. Underground water aquifers is what they're called. I didn't want to cut Councilman Lee off, but they're underground water aquifers. We have natural spring water coming through our ground, and that's what that is. Um, we th that is like it's actually a treasure um, that many people don't even have the the benefit of. But they're underground water aquifers. Thank you. Um, with that being said, Council, what's your pleasure for resolution 2204? I make a, mo a motion for the adoption of resolution 22-04. A second. Clerk Jones, would you please call the roll? Yes. Council member Thomas Morgan. Aye. Council member Hammond. Aye. Vice President Niskowski. Aye. Council Member Davis. Aye. Council Member Lee. Aye. Council Member Warner. Aye. Council Member Wax. Aye. Council Member White. Aye. President McBride. Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you. Resolution 2204 has been adopted. Council, what is your pleasure for resolution 2208? I'll make a motion to move for adoption of bill 2208. Second. Second. Clerk Jones, the roll, please. Council member Hammond. Aye. Council, uh, Council member Davis. Aye. Vice President Niskowski. Aye. Council Member Lee. Aye. Council Member Warner. Aye. Council Member Wax. Aye. Council Member White. Aye. Council Member Tomas Morgan. Aye. President McBride. Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you. Um, resolution 2208 has been adopted. We will now move to bills on first reading. Clerk Jones, would you please give, give Bill 02-22 a first reading? Yes. 02-22, first reading on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, amending the zoning ordinance for property located at 239 Chapin, Councilmatic District Number 2 in the City of South Bend, Indiana. Thank you. I would like to entertain a motion to send Bill uh, to ZNA and for public hearing a third reading on February 28th, 2022. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Could you call the roll, please? Yes. Vice President Niskowski. Aye. Council Mem Member Davis. Aye. Council Member Lee. 
Aye. Council Member Warner. Aye. Council Member Wax. Aye. Council Member White. Aye. Council Member Tomas Morgan. Aye. Council Member Hammond. Aye. President McBride. Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you, Clerk Jones. Would you please give Bill 03-22 a first reading? 0322, first reading on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, approving a petition of the Advisory Board of Zoning Appeals for the property located at 1701 Kendall Street, Councilmanic District Number 6 in the City of South Bend, Indiana. Thank you. I would like to entertain a motion to send this to ZNA and for public hearing and third reading on February 14, 2022. So move. Second. Second. The roll, please. Council Member Davis. Aye. Council Member Lee. Aye. Council Member Warner. Aye. Council Member Wax. Aye. Council Member White. Aye. Council Member Thomas Morgan. Aye. Council Member Hammond. Aye. Vice President Niskoski. Aye. President McBride. Aye. Nine eyes. Thank you, Clerk Jones. Would you please give Bill 04-22 a first reading? 0422, first reading on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, amending the zoning ordinance for property located at 2122 and 2128 South Bend Avenue, Councilmanic District Number 4 in the City of South Bend, Indiana. I would like to entertain a motion to send Bill 04-22 to ZNA and public hearing at third reading on February 28th, 2022. So moved. Second. The roll, please. Council Member Lee. Aye. Council Member Warner. Aye. Council Member Wax. Aye. Council Member White. Aye. Council Member Tomas Morgan. Aye. Council Member Hammond. Aye. Council uh, Vice President Niskoski. Aye. Council Member Davis. Aye. President McBride. Aye. Nine ayes. Clerk Jones, would you please give a first reading to Bill 05-22? 05-22. First reading on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, amending the zoning ordinance for property located at 2240 Prairie Councilmanic District Number 6 in the City of South Bend, Indiana. Thank you. I would like to entertain a motion to send Bill 05-22 to ZNA and for public hearing and third reading on February 28, 2022. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you, Clerk Jones. The roll, please. Yes. Council Member Warner. Aye. Council Member Wax. Aye. Council Member White. Aye. Council Member Thomas Morgan. Aye. Council Member Hammond. Aye. Vice President Niskowski. Aye. Council Member Davis. Aye. Council Member Lee. Aye. President McBride. Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you. Clerk Jones, could you please give reading, first reading to 06-22? 0622, first reading on an ordinance of the Common Council of the City of South Bend, Indiana, amending ordinance number 10817-21, which fixes maximum salaries and wages of appointed officers and non-bargaining employees of the City of South Bend for calendar year 2022 to establish two full-time positions and amend various titles and salaries of existing full-time positions. Thank you. I would like to entertain a motion to send Bill 0622 to Personnel and Finance and for public hearing and third reading on February 14, 2022. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. Thank you. The roll, please. Council Member Wax. Aye. Council Member White. Aye. 
Council Member Tomas Morgan. Aye. Council Member Hammond. Aye. Vice President Niskowski. Aye. Council Member Davis. Aye. Council Member Lee. Aye. Council Member Warner. Aye. President McBride. Aye. Nine ayes. Thank you. Unfinished business. Just a reminder that uh, the Office of the Mayor is planning the second round of his quarterly events called Meet the Mayor and the Team of South Bend. It will be uh, is a replacement or a reworked version of the Mayor's Night Out, and it will take place at on February the 8th from 6 to 8 at O'Brien Fitness Center. All departments will be there and asking for Common Council uh, for our participation if you are available. There will be a table there for council to interact with the community. Is there any other unfinished business from council? Uh, Councilman Davis. Thank you. Um, oh, it's three things. I got three things. OK, so the first thing, um, the baby box thing, I was serious about access. Um, I wasn't stepping on the idea. I'm just saying that if we're in a critical place in this country with people dropping their infants, newly born infants off at fire stations or to grocery stores or wherever they determine is the best place, the access needs to be across the city and just not in the corner of the city. Uh, my district has abortion clinics. I'm not saying one is different or better than the other. That's not what I'm saying. But if we're interested in providing people the option uh, that they, they deserve, then we need to provide the option across the board in every district. This does not stay with one thing and celebrate it. Let, let's, let keep, let's keep it going on. The second thing, um, does anyone know if there is um, any, I guess, standard for response when a department head is sent an email or made a phone call to that particular department head. So a council member calls a department head and there is a question or a request. How long does that department head, head have before they respond? Does anyone know the question, the answer to that question? Yes, no, no, yes. I don't think I can I, I can speak for myself. I don't think I can answer for that for administration or um, the the council. So I'm I cannot answer that question. So I can't so, either. There's nothing in writing in terms of a policy that I, I am aware of. My question is, then should we entertain a policy? There are emails that I've sent out about different things that goes on within my district. I have not heard back from a few department heads about these questions that I have. Some people do respond, but the majority do not respond and they do respond. It's a very long time. So I don't get a 48 hour response. I get maybe a 72 hour or longer than that, or maybe not at all. So as a council member, if I am sending uh, emails out, per my job to a department head based upon the work and the actions of the department, I am due a response, yes or no. If so, then how long do we give that department head to respond? And if not, if we don't have anything in writing, which I got, then there needs to be a policy for it or some sort of agreement. I think it's really bad when a department head does not respond to the council member who has thousands of constituents that are asking for an answer. Bob, can we please get that research, please? I will. Thank you, sir. Greatly needed. The last thing, um, and this goes to our virtual meetings. Um, I am still not necessarily in favor of what's happening. 
I believe that we need to be downtown. Reason being is that we have asked all of our first responders to be out. We've asked our kids to go to school. We asked the teachers to go to go to school and teach. We've asked everyone to go to work, but the elected official. Although we do have the authority to change up our meetings and meet virtually, if everyone else is going to work, why aren't we going to work? I believe that this looks pretty bad on this end of the city. Uh, the leadership and all of us that are elected officials that we can sit in the comfort of our home away from anything that may present an issue and then tell everyone else to go to work. And so I didn't vote for us to be downtown. Um, and just like we did, we just were asking people to go to marriage night out. And still, the council is meeting virtually. Again, I didn't raise my hand, yes or no, to meeting virtually, but I really believe that the council uh, deserves a vote on whether we vote uh, meet virtually or not. Thank you, Councilman Davis. Um, but that's that, that's a motion. It wasn't a motion, actually. Oh, well, the motion is being made that we uh, recount the council to see if we can uh, meet um, virtually or not. No, I don't. I don't know that motion. I made the decision for us to meet. You made the uh, decision. Well, you're making the decision that everybody else has to go to work, but we don't. And no, that's we're unfair. Still work, we're still working from. No, home we're right not now. working downtown. What? Whether you're at home or whether you are. Uh, we're not downtown, home, Sharon. We, we will be doing the same thing that we're doing now. I made the decision. No, we wouldn't be doing the same thing if we were downtown. I made, I made the decision and we are moving forward. I told the council um, if you were present. It, it doesn't matter what forward, you told them or not. I'm telling you the optics. Moving forward. I appreciate your comment. Council, is there any other thing that you have? Thank you so much. And I believe that was a uh, new business. The baby box was, uh, or the mayor's night out was unfinished business. I think the other things were new business. And I would ask council, do you have any other new business? Oh, I see uh, Councilwoman Thomas Morgan. Yes, thank you, President McBride. Just briefly, I just like to remind the public that um, they're eligible. Everyone, every family is eligible to, um, for free uh, at home COVID tests and uh, want to make that website available. It's covidtest.gov. Um, each home in the US is eligible to order four at home COVID tests. The tests are completely free and the orders will usually ship in uh, seven to two weeks. So order your supply now and have them ready. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. At this time, we will go to the privilege of the floor. Um, again, I will read the statement, disrespectful, rude, or disruptive speech or actions will not be tolerated. Such speech and or actions as well as verbal attacks on any person may result in an individual without notice forfeiting the remainder of his or her allotted time. Individuals who wish to address the council must state their name and a residential address. Individuals will be limited to three minutes only. The maximum time limit for this portion of the meeting shall be 30 minutes. Individuals shall not be permitted to address topics which the council has heard previously on tonight's agenda. The council president may assign a topic raised by an individual during the privilege of the floor to the appropriate council member and or request the city clerk to contact a member of city administration for review and topics assigned shall be responded to at the next scheduled council meeting. Um, clerk Jones, do you see anyone wishing to uh, utilize the privilege of the floor? Yes, we have um, Jason Benicki. Jason, if you would unmute yourself and state your name and your address for the record, please. Uh, Jason Benicki, 3822 Ford Street. Uh, just a couple of quick things. Uh, one um, is just kind of a, a matter of, I think it's good record keeping and I think it allows people who look at the record to kind of better see uh, where our city employees live. Um, you know, we're required to give a residential address yet we allow employees of the city who are taking taxpayer dollars to just say, hey, I work on the 14th floor. I feel like those individuals should just just the same as a council member or a person in the public speaking have to put their pub their 
their residential address as part of the public record. That way, we, you know, we can get a feel for where those folks who work for our city and and take our tax dollars actually live and where those tax dollars are actually going to. I think that just is fair and fair all around. Um, the other thing I would like to bring up, um, I would like to make mention of a organization that I've done uh, quite a bit of research on and done a lot of studying on things that they talk about um, over the last year, year and a half, as it pertains to infrastructure improvements, community development, uh, community investment, um, and it informs a lot of what I bring. And I think it's good reading for anybody who sits on a council, who sits in a state legislator, who even sits in Congress, and it's strong, strongtowns.org. Um, it's led by Chuck Moran, uh, who was a city uh, planner and city engineer um, in Minnesota. And I think it just has a ton of great resources that explains, uh, you know, I'll pick one topic that I think is perfect, is just road design. Um, and if you, you know, I live on Ford Street, so I'll use that as the perfect example. Um, if you go down Ford just east of Walnut, the speed limit is 25 miles an hour. Um, unfortunately, since we're not in person, I can't show pictures. Uh, but you can see that road is designed like you're supposed to drive 25 miles an hour on it. Then you go down Ford further west in front of Harrison, it's still 25 miles an hour. Now the road has widened. You know, there's more on-street parking that's seldom used. So now it's you know, same speed limit, but the road kind of tell is designed for you to drive much faster. Then you get down even further west on on Ford Street to Navarre Middle School. I guess they don't call it Navarre Middle anymore, but I'll show my age there. And again, it's still 25 miles an hour, but now the road has widened even further. The curbs are sloped. And again, the design of the road is not designed to force the driver to, to go 25. And, and we talk a lot about things like how can we do, you know, traffic calming measures and and spending millions of dollars to try and slow people down in the neighborhood when we could kind of kill two birds with one stone. If we design the streets right initially, you know, make sure that the curbs are, are, are taller, that there's trees in those tree lawns because it narrows the visual field, you know, make it less safe for the driver, but more safe for the pedestrian and the people who live there, you know, you're going to naturally slow down the speed. And two, then you have less long-term infrastructure to maintain which means you know we're not on a 75 year repaving schedule for our roads because we're not paving a bunch of unused parking space on the, the streets. And, and again, this organization focuses on a lot of that things, but I just picked that one as kind of a good starting point. Uh, thank you guys. That exhausts the list of speakers for the privilege of the floor. Thank you so much. With that, I will call this meeting adjourned. Have a good evening. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. President. Good night. Thank good you, night. President McBride. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.